as I like but to say. People should have the freedom of choice for sure. Sure, sure, whatever. Like, but like libertarians are like house cats, fully dependent upon a system they neither understand nor appreciate. 100% agree with that, by the way. Like, yeah. like, ha like me and you handshake on that. Yeah, like, yeah, I there fully you go. agree yeah. on that. <laughs> Good. I did not expect you to have this view, so thank you for elaborating on this. I don't think you're crazy. I don't think the EAC, you know, some of your, some of your followers are crazy. <laughs> um, but like a lot of the people that, you know, follow the kinds of beliefs you talk about, I don't think you're crazy. Yeah, we, we just think that currently the current discussion with AI regulation is led by the current day oligopoly sure. and they're the ones sure. writing the laws. And so we're deeply skeptical of everything totally being written right now, but we're not in principle against regulations if okay. they help acceleration. Right? In today's presentation, Bef Jezos, also known as Guillaume Verdon, started the EAC movement or the Effective Acceleration Movement. It borrows heavily from the idea of accelerationism, which means that we should hasten the advance of technology and capitalism at the cost of everything else. The main you know, theory of physics that is most relevant is thermodynamics. That's what Nick Land did, you know? Like Nick Land allegedly used to be a Marxist and he was taking, doing Marxist capital analysis of like what happens if techno capital gains more and more power. And his conclusion was eventually there is only capital. There's no labor, there's only capital. There's no people, there's no happiness. There's only competition. There is only capital. Capital itself becomes sentient. And like this is before like AI was a big topic. It's like the nineties when he wrote this kind of stuff, right? And he's the only goddamn person in all of accelerationists who actually t bites the bullet and actually goes all the way. If you cap compute at a certain threshold for LLMs, that affects, let's say, drug discovery research, where we might need way more compute than that to 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 do our research, right? Or or materials research, and that has a net negative effect because it's still AI, and and above that compute threshold, right? And so what I'm arguing for is let's be very careful as to like what legislation we crystallize, and let, let's have it be as light touch as possible. I think there will be some regulation. I'm realistic. Um, but I, I, I do think that we have to be mindful of like what we're going to affect in terms of po potential positive effects of enabling high compute uh, AI research. Uh, like we, we don't, we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot uh, with any sort of regulation. I, I don't think what's been proposed so far has been good. Like, bro, you create a fictional character and now you take on his beliefs rather than your own on Twitter. Like I, I, you're letting the Twitter algorithm pick what thoughts you think. Like you can do better than this. You need to improve your mimetic hygiene. Yes, but that's the point. You want nuanced discussion. You don't want the shit that Beth is doing on Twitter. Like, if you had come into here, like, George, but worse, then I would be like, yeah, you're Beth, go on. But you're not Beth. You're not. You don't want Beth. So who is this Beth guy? Well, he was recently on the Lex podcast. He's got a PhD in physics. In fact, he used to be a quantum computing engineer over at Google. And a man after my own heart, in this respect at least, he's a big fan of thermodynamic intelligence or the physics of intelligence. And fans of the show will know that that's right up our street. So um, certainly in, in that respect, I am a fan of, of Beth. Enforces this, this, this uh, equilibrium in a top-down fashion. And that, that I think is a bad trade and I, wouldn't, I don't want to take it, right? Great. And that's where so, we, yeah. Congratulations as Lord of the Doomer, you know, Honor Society, I sew upon you the rank of Doomer. You are now yeah. become a Doomer. You are a Doomer. <laughs> you are a Doomer. Because you believe that both, that we are basically fucked. We agree that if monopoly then inducing or, or achieving regulatory capture is bad. And that's also what we're fighting in the present moment we feel like is happening and that the AI safety discussion is being leveraged instrumentally for this yeah. regulatory capture. And I don't even disagree with you. Also joining us today is the world's second most famous Duma, Connor Leahy. Connor founded the Aloifa AI group and also co-founded Conjecture. And I was over at Conjecture in their offices in London. Um, by the way, we filmed about 70 minutes of pre-interviews and smack talk, which is on our Patreon. And we also filmed about 30 minutes or so post-debate uh, with uh, Beth and, and Connor. So check out those videos on our Patreon. We can do such incredible things, and yet people have to fear for their lives, their stability, 
their family, they have to watch their parents grow old, the constant struggle of politics, of corruption, of all these things, and we can do better. Right. Okay, so you hear it here first, guys. EAC is not about maximizing entropy from the, wor the, wor the mouth of the man himself. It's about maximizing free energy dissipation over time, which is what out of equilibrium thermodynamics optimum, we're, we're, we're prone to being manipulated, right? Man, like, this is just cope. What you're describing is, is that reality is hard. We dropped a nuke on South Carolina accidentally. It's still there. It's in the swamp. It's That's still funny. there. And it was pure luck that the, the, it was actually armed. The nuke was armed. And we got so lucky then that what? it just I mean, it misfired. It, a city would have been blown up. It, it would, the, the world would not have ended, actually. So Yes, sure. But awful. like, what happens if that ha If you, this is the rate? Every decade or two, we drop you know, one, a nuke on South Carolina. And our nukes get better and better and better. And eventually, the nukes are synthetic bioweapons. I don't... You know, AGI, ASI, these kinds of things. What happens? So, I mean, even bioweapons, um, there was a leak of a bioweapon. We didn't all die. We probably all got COVID once Again, or twice. Yes, sure. The world has never ended in the past. This is true until it's not. Like, this isn't an argument. What do you, Gim, what do you think we should do? Do. What should we do? Yes. Um, well, I try to enact my values, right? I mean, I work What are your on... values? I'm trying to figure out what your values are. Is what we're trying to find out. You I'm trying to scale about... civilization, right? I, 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 like, so personally, my, my life's mission... I, again, I'm asking you, for the whole world, you know, whether or not the Chinese already have it or not, would releasing all of our secret, you know, engineering documents of all... But NFC 16 is a force for destruction. It's not a force for positive econo economic utility. You're in your drawing these comparisons all day. I am, I'm trying, I'm not trying to make negative. a comparison. This is not a metaphor. You are, I, but you're, you're just I, lost in analogies not... and analogies and analogies. Let's talk about AI directly, right? You're just trying to like... Answer the question. So if you follow in the will of God, he shall reward the faithful. Yeah. That's your ideology? I mean, it, it, physics is my God to some extent. I'm not trying to actually replace humans. I'm working on like physics-based intelligence, like trying to understand uh, chemistry, uh, materials, you know, uh, Great uh, stuff. fusion, nuclear fusion, carbon capture. There you so. go. Respect, man. Like, respect. I mean, you're wrong and you're going to make everything worse, but respect. <laughs> you tried. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> like, you know, you will say the same thing about me, obviously. And like, I, you know. I think we both agree, though, that we want people to have more agency and step up. Like, there are no adults in the room. Yes. Coming to save us, right? I, exactly. I think for me, that realization in my mid 20s was when I was the adult in the room. Like, this is the thing you need to understand. A lot of people are actually evil. And if you make an ideology that justifies evil, they will use it. You can make ideologies that do not justify evil or justify it less. Like, I don't know how to say this in a polite way, but Beth is evil. Like, Gim is an evil. Beth is evil. Like, Beth is an evil character. And I think you wrote him intentionally to be evil. Yeah, so uh, we're pleased to have the Society Library map out uh, the debate today, uh, create a chart of all the arguments that are made. Um, it's a great uh, nonprofit uh, made to uh, chart out uh, arguments in, in full detail. And so there's going to be a recap you'll be able to access in the link in the description. OK, well, in which case we should kick off the debate. So this is the amazing moment that we've all been waiting for. And if you don't mind, Beth, I'm going to ask Connor just to kick off with his opening sure. statements. Yeah, I mean, the first thing I want to say is really glad to talk to you, man. It's uh, not through the anonymous veil where, you know, things <laughs> can get a bit feisty at times. Sure. Um, so big respect. Really glad Likewise. to talk to you and so on. You know, we disagree on some things, but, you know, let's talk them out. You know, let's see where yeah. things go. And if we end up disagreeing, that's OK, too. So I just really appreciate it. Just really want to get that. I just want to have that said. Uh, I think this is going to be really fun. Like, you know, Likewise. as much as I disagree with you on many things, I do like a lot of your style. I like a lot of your aesthetic, a lot of good humor and so on. So really appreciate that. And I think it'll be really good. But I guess the thing like that would for me be the most interesting, at least that I'm most interested in to start with kind of is like, I don't, I'm not too interested in like going too deep into talking about abstract stuff right away or so on. And like, one of the things that's something difficult with me when talking with you in the past or like reading your content in the past has been is that I feel like there's sometimes a bit of a bait and switch 
where sometimes, you know, you or someone in your movement would say something which I would find rather crazy or extreme. And then when I try to engage with it, it said, oh, no, no, we're joking. It's not meant literally like we're just, it's just a metaphor, you know, or it's just a vibe. So I'd be interested if we could maybe start off this discussion. So I'm coming from, you know, more of a safetyist perspective, more like, you know, technology is both good and bad. It's neutral. It's, it, it can go well, it can go bad, depending on how we deal with it. And so from this perspective, I'm really interested to kind of hear from you. Like, do you think there is, can you imagine any technology that you think should be banned? Any technology to be banned, like in its entirety or like certain in its entirety, of it? Like just entirety, like where you think like the world would be better if we like made sure no one had this technology. Um, has any technology ever been successfully banned? Ever? That's a different question. I'm not saying whether it's enforceable. I'm asking whether, like, if it could be, like, do you, would you find this? Dis- I just don't think it's think- enforceable, right? Like, you- uh, that's fair. But if you could enforce it, do you? Would you think that there would be such things? We use all these ab- abstract theories in, in EAC. Really, I'm just a, you know, high lo- high dimensional optimization scientist. Uh, I worked in quantum machine learning. Now doing thermodynamic AI, and that's sort of the technical lens I, I view everything. And to me. Finding technologies that have positive utility to everyone is a sort sort of search process. And if you have, you don't know when like a technology that could uh, mostly yield negative reward, for example, you know, nuclear fission is, you know, a few edit distance away from a technology that could yield massive positive reward like nuclear energy or nuclear fusion. And so that's sort of, the general um, uh, mindset of EAC is that, you know, there, there's a lot of closing doors entirely. There's a lot of potential upside. We don't even know. We might be leaving on the, uh, on the table and we got to be really mindful of that. And it's supposed to be a sort of balancing force to the natural human tendency to sort of fear the unknown. Or if we have a, a sort of first order model of, hey, here's a potential negative effect of a certain technology, maybe we should close that door, shut it down. Um, you know, going back to the nuclear analogy, right? Like I, I, I do think they're sort of the, 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 the mindset sort of yielded a net, pretty net negative outcome. I think we'd be far better off if we had far less regulation and we had had far less fear mongering towards uh, nuclear fission. I think we'd be in a much more prosperous society. And so I would say, um, you know, Define, but define ban, like who, who enforces it, right? Is it a peer to peer thing between countries or is it a top down? And, and and I'd love to like dive into like enforcement of, of yeah. rules. I, I, I think to me, like, yes, some technologies can have negative uh, impact, but in general, uh, the, the thesis is that uh, the market and civilization tends to sort of provide amplify or provide more resources towards developing technologies that have net positive uh, utility or positive effects towards growth of either uh, an individual company, nation, or, or all of civilization. And that that sort of um, probabilistic safety or sort of natural selection in space of technologies on the short term can yield sort of negative fluctuations, but in the long term, uh, post selects for for things that have positive utility towards growth, right? And it's a much more nuanced way than like directly legislating uh, uh, technologies to, to steer the technological landscape manually in, in a certain direction. From from at the end of the day, you have a model of how things would play out if you let that technology be be unregulated. And and I guess our, our core thesis is that this sort of uh, adaptive uh, algorithm that is the the market um, uh, is a better heuristic. It's a better online adaptive uh, search than sort of top down model based control that would, you know, uh, include you know legislating from the top down. Um, and so, but yeah, happy to expand upon that uh, if you have if you want me to dig in. But happy to dig into anything. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the elaboration. Um, 
good to hear from you precisely. But I want to go and I would actually like to put a pin on the enforcement for just a second here. And I think a lot of your models are sensible, like thinking about how the market isn't much better than a lot of top down control in many ways. I definitely agree with that in many circumstances. I don't want to dismiss this argument by any sense. Um, but I'd like to, I feel like you still haven't answered my question. My question wasn't, you know, should all technology be banned or should this, I'm asking, can you imagine there being a technology that should be banned? Like, is it an acceptable thing in your ontology? Or do you think this does not, like, this cannot even exist? Um, I think, I think there are technologies that we, we can ban, like, if there are pure net negative play and the legislation is very sharp and pointed towards the um, uh, usage of it, let's say, as, as a net negative uh, impact towards the world. Uh, yes, but like how how is that enforced, right? It, it depends on, sure. on so yeah. much, right? Uh, Absolutely. And, uh, and how is the law written? Um, and I, I, I do think like overall, like I, I see legislation as sort of uh, hyperparameter uh, settings for, mm -hmm. you know, certain let's say countries or, or subsystems of, of, of the whole system. And it's a sort of somewhat discrete architecture search process that we're doing. But o overall, the thesis is that um, you can have countries that will maybe over legislate some that will under legislate. But eventually, if we if we had a, a nice and malleable legal system, or, 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 you know, if governments were very dynamic uh, with their legislation, including sunsetting clauses and and, and, and updating regulation in sensible fashion, we would have a very healthy adaptive algorithm to converge on what are the opt what is the optimal legislation to have sort of sustainable fall tolerant uh, growth. Um, but I don't think that's the system we have today. And I guess what we're seeing is a sort of second law of bureaucratic complexity uh, these days uh, where legislations are added and bureaucratic complexities added, but not so much uh, removed. Uh, and so the bias right as, as it stands right now, how we do things in government is towards this system is so archaic, just like let the market regulate itself uh, and uh, you know, keep your hands off. And by market regulating itself, I mean, you know, if I if I'm a company and I deploy a technology that is net negative reward to my peers, we have a sort of peer to peer formalization of sort of violence between corporations and meta organisms like lawsuits, right? And it's 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 basically uh, uh, legal lawfare, legal warfare, uh, and and you cause economic damage to the other organism if it induces negative reward on on the other ones right and so so that's kind of a that is a sort of restorative force towards so, not so doing terrible if things I stand, right to, to so one if i stand yeah. correctly you perceive lawsuits as part of the market because lawsuits are from my perspective regulation um well regulation sets the the prior of how uh legal dispute will be resolved, but and you know, there, there's a continuum. And which things are legal disputes to begin with, like, and also the enforcement. Like, the reason lawsuits have teeth is that if you violate what the court says, they send police after you. Yeah, so, so, so the point, well, eventually, uh, right, like, if you can't peer-to-peer -peer enforce uh, a certain, certain behavior, right, which I think... By peer-to-peer enforce, do you mean mercenaries? Like, what would that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't know. I, I'm yeah? just very, um, well, I'm very weary, and we'll get into this. I would really like to get into that component of sort of the monopoly on uh, uh, sort of cre creating like a, a, a physical power asymmetry, right, through violence monopoly in a top-down fashion, and also having intellectual power asymmetry through, through AI. I'm very weary of having very strong top-down power asymmetry. I understand that your prior is that by uh, deferring uh, power to a higher uh, node in the in the hierarchy of control of, of, of society, like let's say a government or, or some sort of leadership, you minimize sort of peer to peer sort of competition and friction by sort of having that that authority sort of ensure uh, peace. Um, but I do think one that, outcome, but yes, 
possible outcome. Yeah, yeah. But I, I do think that we are in a weird... Well, th th this, is, this is a tangent for later, but I, I think we're in a weird period now where there is the window of opportunity for there to be a sort of AI-assisted tyranny to be installed. And to me, that's one of the core existential risks to progress. I don't know if it's fully existential, but it's definitely going to slow down progress for a while if we have a sort of Big Brother-style mm -hmm. uh, authoritarian panopticon. Like, I, I think in, in the present days, there is a danger that you have a monopolization and a centralization of AI that's that coalesces with government, and there's a control of information flow. There's a control of uh, of the truth, what or what we see as the truth, and then that does break uh, democracy, right? Because democracy is the assumption that everyone is informed to some extent, can make their own judgment. They're supposedly uncorrelated variables, which of course in the era, era of algorithmic amplification of information propagation, they're not. Let's say they're uncorrelated variables and you take a sort of uh, average vote, then, then you have a good sort of decision mechanism I think with sort of algorithmic uh, manipulation, especially with AI, I think we're going to have a lot of trouble with that. And so I'm also concerned that there will be attempts to um, feign a sort of democratic vote towards uh, AI safety and, and giving sort of, uh, you know, a monopoly on this intellectual, artificial intellectual power uh, to, to the centralized uh, organizations um, you know, th th this sort of democratic vote will be manufactured consent. And, and then th once the power is centralized, those entities won't want to give it back uh, to the people. And they'll have an ability to maintain that power gradient because intelligence uh, allows you to extract more utility or, or, or filter uh, or engineer uh, information and information is power. So AI is power. And so there's going to be a sort of gravitational effect of, of power and, and, and AI capabilities that, that tends to, to, to centralize, uh, uh, you know, AI capabilities and power overall. And EAC is a sort of, you know, bottom up sort of counterforce to this natural tendency towards centralization and top down control. And so we're, we're, we're trying to push, you know, the Overton window and the discussions toward an extreme of, of, of the hyperparameters re regime. But frankly, with knowledge that, you know, if, if you know, you or, or maybe being not yourself, you're fairly balanced, but like some people in the AI safety camp are, are very concerned with or have a models models with uh, with respect to which they're concerned about the future. And they want to, you know, centralize the control, ha maximize safety versus on the other end, we want to maximize freedom and lower the risk of sort of uh, AI assisted tyranny. Reality is going to fall somewhere in the middle in terms of policy, and and that's why that's that's why we got to have these discussions. Um, but but for us, you know, we we just really want people to factor in that um, historically, giving a monopoly on violence or giving a monopoly on on power to centralized entities that eventually every uh, subsystem in our civilization serves its own interests, including government, uh, that can yield really bad outcomes and we have a better data driven prior of this happening than let's say some sort of artificial super intelligence taking over which tbd if that can exist and what that looks like um and so um to us that's like the sort of existential risk that um we want to 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 minimize is kind of the erosion of our freedoms that seems progressive at first and then all of a sudden you know we're in a really bad spot and we're in a sort of um, top-down enforced dark age where, you know, freedom of compute is non-existent, freedom of access to AI and freedom of access to information is no longer a thing. And so this tangent kind of evolved into a whole uh, discussion, but yeah, please feel free to like jump in whenever you feel like, uh, you, you know, we, we could keep this organic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, um, it's a lot of nice word celery, but like from what I could tell, you made like five to nine points there that were only tangentially related, and I could address them individually, but that's a bit difficult. So I'd like to like bring us kind of back to what started sure. this whole tangent, which is, again, I feel you still haven't answered my question. Should all tech, do you believe all technology, all technology 
should be unregulated, yes or no? Why? I mean, there's no absolutes, right? Like, I think that... So that uh, means, no, you think some technology, really? That's no. Sure. Yeah, okay, sure. Okay, cool. Okay, this is what I want to establish. This is the That's... question I want to ask. Because it okay. would be a crux. Because if you had said yes, then that would have been a crux for me. And we would have to talk about that. But if you sure. say some technology in some circle, cool. Then we can have an object level yeah. discussion. That's great. Now we can have an object level discussion about what technology should be regulated, in what circumstances, what enforcement mechanisms, where do we disagree about how the future goes? Yeah, yeah. If, did that so, make sense? So yep. this is kind of how I would like to have this discussion because you obviously have a lot of you know, ideas in your head. You have a lot of good models that I'd be interested in you know, hearing about as well, maybe pushing back in some of mine as well. I think some of the things sure. you say are definitely true. Like I definitely agree that nuclear regulation turned out to ultimately be mostly net negative to a large degree. Not entirely. I think nuclear weapons regulation is really great. I think it should be even stricter personally. But I definitely agree with you. There's a lot of side effects of this. So yeah, I think mm -hmm. you, you made some good points there. But there's some I also disagree with and I'd like to understand your position a bit more. So like I'd like to, for just to understand, again, I'm just trying to understand kind of like how you view the world and so on. Yeah. So like, I, have a, I have a question. What is your opinion on leaded gasoline? Leaded gasoline? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, the, I think that um, it's it's good that it was banned. I mean, it was net negative, and I think mm -hmm. that um, it induced a sort of selective pressure on the on the space of technologies that was for the better, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so but it was banned by the government, the, the, not by corporate to corporate interests or anything like this. Well. I mean, at some point, if you have a like, if you have enough data that people are suing each other for the same cause, right? Like you've caused uh, me brain damage by putting this chemical in your stuff, uh, then you can you can kind of crystallize that that sort of uh, uh, prior that like this 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 thing tends to happen into legislation. I I think that if you're trying to draw an analogy with AI right now, I think the landscape is moving so fast that um, we don't have enough. Uh, data of how things go wrong, and we don't even know where models and compute are going. That it's far mm -hmm. too early to settle things and set things in stone. And again, mm -hmm. I would be less aggressive on pushing back if there was mm -hmm. a precedent of like sunsetting uh, regulations, which you know doesn't doesn't tend to happen in our current system. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so for me, it's like let's be very careful to like have these one-way decisions where we close the door on a whole spectrum of, of certain technologies. Let's say we have compute caps and whatnot. Uh, uh, like we, we should be really, really thoughtful. And it's I'm, I'm just very skeptical that uh, our models of how this thing uh, will evolve, the progress in AI, are, are necessarily uh, accurate. Whereas like with, with the lead, I mean, there was many studies like, hey, like this is really bad for humans. I mean, it took uh, decades, this is, many decades. It, it took, well... <laughs> It is ruined holds like right? it caused and, but, massive damage to whole generations of people. But I mean, how else you still like before, even with top down policies, right? You can you can make decisions that take time to realize the the nth order effect. And then and then you have to readjust. Right. So whether like so the point like whether you're biased like, towards under or over legis legislation, you can you can screw up in many ways. Right. And, and that's yes. the that's the thing about uh, you know, top-down okay. uh, regulation, and you got to be very careful and, and thoughtful and make sure your model's accurate, right? And, as and, and as not only... The, go ahead, go ahead, please. If we agree that you can screw up in both directions, I think we're on the same page there. This is no yep. question for me. I think a lot of the regulation that has happened, and I, li I like you bringing up the point of sunsetting laws, uh, this is definitely a huge problem. Like, there should be something like, you know, yep. every law has to be, like, rechecked every 10 or 20 years or something. Yes. I think this would be fantastic. I'm strongly in favor of this. So I think this is a good prior that you bring up here, is that, like, given the ways that laws are currently handled, how they're, like, never repealed and so on, we should increase our skepticism towards passing new laws and regulation. I think this is a very reasonable intuition to have, and I want to acknowledge that, yep. that it's a very reasonable intuition to have, and it's one I have as well. But mm -hmm. this doesn't generalize to me then just say that we shouldn't do any regulation, which you don't seem to believe either. So we're kind of on the same page there. And I also want to make very clear here that like I'm not some guy who thinks that like government is awesome and great and regulation is awesome and great by no means. I am mm. try to keep my identity small. You know, I don't really have a politics. I'm not 
I don't care about any specific word or any specific flag. What I care about is what works. What I care about is under my best models of game theory, of uh, technological progress and whatever, what leads to the best outcomes and avoids the most catastrophic outcomes. And I think you would agree with that as well. I'm sure you're trying to do the same thing. Yeah. And so I don't think we disagree. I think we're on the same here. page. We just have yeah. different models of the world. Exactly. And, that, and that's why we're having this discussion. So, that's why it's going so to be like for people to listen. Great. Yeah. So I'd like to go a little bit into some of my models here. So you talked about how, sure. for example, is that like we just don't have data about how things go wrong. And this is reasonable. And I wouldn't dispute this. Like, you know, do I know how AGI will end the world? I don't know. Literally, I don't have studies about AGIs, you know, control do two different planets, you know, and do different solar systems. One of them has AGI, one of them doesn't. I don't have studies like this. And my claim is you don't get studies like this. This is just not how things work. Like, you know, there is, there are certain, what the world you describe, where you can try things, you can, you know, fuck up whole generations of people with poison in their head and then fix things afterwards, is an ergodic world. This is a world where you get to retry. It's a world where you can fail a couple of times, blow your hands off or whatever, but the next generation is going to be fine. And my claim is, and I'd be interested if you disagree with this model, is, is that at some point you exit this world. The world is not ergodic, actually. It's actually very non-ergodic. You can die. You, there's technology that you personally cannot invent because in the process of inventing it, you kill yourself. Like, you know, a part of inventing nuclear technology required us to invent technology to not die while handling nuclear material. This was a very important part. Otherwise, you just can't develop it because you die. So when you're, I'm wondering if you agree with this, forget AI for a moment. That yeah. at some point, not saying it's AI, just at some point, we will develop technology that is so powerful that if you fuck it up, it blows up everybody. Do you agree with this? I mean, in principle, we could already do that if we build a big enough nuke right now, right? Like yeah. we could just blow up the earth, right? Yeah. Um, but have we done that? We yeah, but like uh, uh, nuclear weapons, right? Yes. This is a follow I was just interested if like you think this is possible. So I would agree that like I think we're already in a non-ergodic world. There's already action chains accessible to humans that are non-recoverable. Like if we went down these action chains, we don't learn, we don't get to retry, it's just over. And so when you're dealing with a non-ergodic world where you don't where there are traps, there are paths you can't recover from, you have to play different strategies. Well, you can't just try all the paths. If you just try all the paths in the limit, you die. Yeah, yeah. So, so there are there are paths, you know, where the 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 reward function is like negative infinity. It's you know full existential destruction. So at this stage, for example, what would be a state of the world? It's like big building one nuclear bomb that has enough you know power to like I don't know shatter the earth. It's probably difficult to do uh, right now with I, I don't know all the details. I'm not a nuclear specialists, but but in a sense, like we know that and we don't build that technology because it doesn't have utility uh, to us because we're only interested in our relative positioning with one another because we have this sort of fractal competition uh, at all scales. So what people do is they make smaller nukes uh, that, you know, could damage their enemy, but not destroy themselves in the process, even though, you know, there's the, the game theoretic equilibrium of mutually assured destruction. To be fair, I do think, I do think at least from the models I've seen of nuclear war, uh, I think like ten or twenty percent of human population uh, survives, and on a long time scale, we would probably recover. Uh, so it's not actually fully existential uh, risk yet. Uh, but again, if we had a nuclear bomb above a certain threshold uh, that was just sitting there, you know, with a big red button, uh, that would be bad. So, but. Okay. Yeah. Cool. If if we're try if we're gonna try to draw an analogy to the AI, I think we're still very far from that. Yeah. Uh, but this is. I'm, I, I'm not trying to make the analogy yeah. yet. We'll, we'll get there. Yeah. I'm well, not making it yet. It's cooking. All right. So now imagine, um, you know, uh, let's say I, you know, drink a bunch of leaded gasoline and decide this whole AI safety thing is stupid. I'm gonna go join my friend Guillaume and his startup that's built on quantum hardware. Right. I'm like, let's go. Not quantum. So. Yeah. Sure. Uh, what, what, yeah. Sorry, I don't know the details of your actual. Don't stuff, worry about but it. Like, yeah. let's let's say it's quantum because it sounds cool. 
So, um, thermo, sure. Yeah, yep. thermo, quantum, whatever. But let's let's go with quantum for a sec. So let's say I join you. We work on some cool hardware chips, and we're doing some create. You're a physicist, so like you, you know, I'll mm -hmm. use some physicist stuff. And I know this is not exactly sure. correct, but indulge me. And okay, fair let's say while we're doing our experiments late at night in our secret laboratory, we go through the data, and suddenly we notice, oh shit, we're in a false vacuum. So oh. what this means is for the viewer, a false vacuum is a hypothetical. Uh, quantum event or a system where you, the vacuum energy is not zero. What this means is, is that if you could trigger what's called a vacuum collapse, you would basically destroy chemistry. It's just like there would be an irradiating shell outwards where all the physics, like all the stars stop, all life stops, everything. And this could happen very suddenly with a very small trigger, hypothetically. We, is this probably not true? But let's say in our hypothetical experiment it was true. And we find out that our hardware can trigger a vacuum collapse. Like we figured out how to do it with our hardware. And this hardware can be manufactured, say, with a, you know, in a semiconductor fab. If such a technology existed and you and me had it, what do you think we should do with it? I think that if uh, the vacuum was in a, so, so for, for reference, it's like the, you know, instead of being in the ground state uh, of, of, you know the the quantum field. You would be in a in a little local minimum. And then there's a true ground state. And then, first of all, I would imagine that to to engender this this this, this jump, you'd need quite a bit of energy. A another thing is like, um. Anyways, I won't. I, I don't believe in false vacuum. That that's a whole I don't either, discussion. But just, I, I just don't yeah, yeah yeah yeah. But um. Essentially, I think like if that were the case, that a tiny nudge would blow everything up we would be in a highly unstable situation mm -hmm. um i think that there is a certain like even if you had if you alerted formed a world government and you alerted the authorities and this would be the most secretive secret on earth it would have a certain coherence time a certain shelf life and basically we'd yeah. already be dead like like on i would mm -hmm. be surprised this is like just like terminal mm -hmm. at that stage I don't think that's the case. I don't think there's anything like that that's the case. Like, I mean, sure. some people thought a more realistic scenario is like, um, you know, if you theoretically crank up the LHC high enough energy, you might yeah, create a black yeah. hole. Uh, but if that usually black holes that are tiny, they, they radiate away through Hawking radiation. But but assuming you could have created a black hole that starts consuming everything like it would have been but it would have been problematic. Uh, anyways, we can have a whole technical discussion. Yeah, why yeah, of course. That, that's not the case. So, but uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. the, the only reason so. I bring this up is just kind of like, um, maybe I'll get you in a bit of the mindset of like, if you did believe that, like if you did see this happening, like you would reasonably come to the conclusion I think you came to, where like, wow, we're really fucked. Like, we're really fucked. Like not even government can save us. Like this is a really well, bad situation to be in. I still, th well, so here's the thing, right? Like if there's a, if there's a, piece of physics or technology that we don't understand and is dangerous, we should, we still need to study it in order to uh, mm -hmm. control it and, and, and make sure, for example, I don't know, like we're, we're in completely hypothetical land here, but like, let's say there was a way to create this local instability, there's a way to contain that or, you know, uh, correct it, you know, Usually, if you can control a state to go from one from A to B, sometimes you could go from B to A. There's all sorts of, yeah. Like my my point is, um, like I I think we should still like we we should study. Uh, well, that's why we're studying physics, right? Like we we gotta know, you know. Mm -hmm. For example, I think a past twenty thirty years, you know, we were looking for are there extra folded dimensions that could just freaking unfold right now yep. or you know, like, and when we had to test that, right? Like, really, it's like there's there's kind of the unknown where we our instruments and our life lives in a certain band of energies, and anything beyond that, we we don't know. And in a sense, we kind of have a responsibility for our own uh, survival to to try to explore that. And I guess like uh, explore those those areas of the unknown that we don't have perception. Here, I think we're talking instead of like regimes of energy, we're talking about regimes of intelligence. What does like intelligence look like beyond a certain threshold, right? And and we don't know. 
right? We don't know yeah. at, at the current time. And that's why we're exploring. Uh, and that's why, yeah. you know, we have folks like OpenAI, Anthropic, yourself, et cetera, right? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you're, you're already jumping ahead in the analogy, but yeah, like, so, okay. So there might be, you know, dark voids and, you know, dark horrors in the physics. I think you agree. Like we might be in a false vacuum or there might be some other thing out there. So like, you know, not likely, maybe not false vacuum specifically, but like it's imaginable so, that there are horrors. So here's, here's a, here's a, okay. So, I mean, you're leading this conversation. Here's, here's a, a similar mm -hmm. sort of question for you. Mm -hmm. What if there were very advanced aliens that have very advanced technology that are kind of scouting the Earth right now? Um, you know, completely hypothetical scenario. Would you feel a sense of urgency towards accelerating our technological progress to ensure the f ensure that we become formidable enough to uh, sort of defend ourselves. I mean, there are analogies with AI, so we will compare it to an alien force invading us. And so do you feel like, don't you feel there is a sense of urgency to make humans more formidable in order to ensure our, our, our safety against the unknown, right? Like could also be, you know, I mean, at some point we're going to oscillate out of the galactic plane and there's going to be more asteroids. We need much more control of the rocks that are getting hurtled our way. So we have a responsibility to scale up our space exploration technologies to, for survival, but wouldn't, wouldn't you feel that urgency and wouldn't you be kind of more open-minded towards taking a bit more risks, AKA like just venturing into the unknown to, to seek upside because, you know, you could get uh, uh, disrupted otherwise, right? I, I think we're, I think that's why you founded your company. You're trying to make humans more formidable by solving alignment. I think that's what people, well, some people solving alignment are trying to do, right? They're trying to mm -hmm. augment humans to make them, you know, more formidable, which I'm totally for, right? That That's like, mm -hmm. I think we should, we should uh, seek that path. Um, but I think that, um, well, we're, we're getting into AI now, but to, to me, I think all paths will, will be like explored. I think there's going to be sort of aligned AIs that are extensions to humans are going to be like totally independent AIs. And then there's going to be like full Luddites that <laughs> don't want any technology and you're going to have all three and you know, all bets are off at that point. Right. So, yeah. And I mean, I definitely don't disagree with you that risk taking is necessary and important. And you're also correct that if you're under threat, it might be sensible to increase your risk tolerance budget, but this isn't an either or. So I, I agree with you on an emotional level that yeah, if like there was aliens threatening humanity or whatever, I would be like, well, we should take some more risks with nukes. But that doesn't mean I think we should take arbitrary risks with nukes. Because no, a lot of, at some point it wraps back around to being embarrassing. There is like a glorious, you know, we tried and we failed. There's also a really embarrassing, we took all the safeties off the nukes and they exploded in, in our Air Force bases. And my claim is, is that the current state of AI safety in EAC is firmly in the, our nukes exploded while still in our Air Force bases. Our nukes exploded? Has like, like we didn't even take AI off. Nukes? We didn't even get the nukes into space. We, we like, they blow up on our airfield. We didn't even get them into space. Like we were ready to have the heroic standing against the aliens. We didn't even get them off the planet. This Wait, is where I has think- has something happened in AI where it's been that catastrophic so far? Not or? yet, but your, I, my prediction is, is that if we just don't even try, if we just accelerate as fast as possible, that's what happens. It's not heroic, it's not epic. It's just, we make stronger and stronger systems that we understand less and less and less. We get more and more confused. Things accelerate more and more and more. And then one day we wake up with, you know, our finger up our ass and we have no more control. I think that um, it's a bit different with like the nuclear analogy is mostly, it's all about engineering negative reward uh, for your adversaries, right? To, to maintain sort of that, uh, you know, game theoretic equilibrium. I think with AI, there's a lot of upside to accelerating, right? And there's lives that could be saved and that has to be priced into the, the risk calculations, right? The longer we mm -hmm. wait to develop technologies, you know, there's all sorts of biotech, material science. There's there's a lot of upside we are leaving on the table and having a model where we only look at the tail event, uh, like tail probabilities of, of extreme downsides is, is very biased in terms of our 
or sort of uh, cost benefit. Uh, oh, I agree. And, if I was, and, and... if it was only tail risks, I would agree with you. I just don't think they're tail risks. Okay. Well, we could we could we could dig into that. Um, but I'm Let's do I'm it. just not. I am not convinced that there's this sort of um, fast takeoff threshold. I'm not convinced that uh, we can't achieve a sort of multipartite uh, adversarial equilibrium by making sure capabilities, you know, multi mul multiple parties have access to to advanced capabilities and ke keep each other in check. Um, anyways, we we can get into mm -hmm. it. I don't know where you want to take this. Yeah, um, I mean. My, my simple question is, well, you have a bunch of AGIs competing. Why would the one mm -hmm. that makes that spends its resources giving humans a good life win and not the one which is maximizing its, you know, kill all the other people and AI's potential? Why doesn't that one win? Well, I mean, you can say that about companies or countries. I, I do say that about countries. companies and countries. <laughs> this is a good question. Well, Why don't they? This is a good question. Well, because there's a positive sum game to it's positive sum to cooperate, you know, we, we've entangled our economic systems even against our, our current adversaries. But why? And we, why did we do that? Do, why do we do what you Because, gems? yeah, so I think that all, like, the, 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 the theory to some extent behind EAC is that the system will adapt towards whatever policies and, and technologies and ways of doing things that are optimal for growth. And mm -hmm. that, I mean, just by construction, like, things that grow, you know, they, they replicate or, or like if, if you post select in the future, odds are you're post selecting for things that have high fitness towards growth, right? Yes. Uh, and so, um, like, for example, if you have a very aggressive uh, regime, right, that's just threatening everyone and not adding a lot of economic utility, they get shut out of the, out of, the of the system, or or they get like, you know, peer to peer, like enforced, like, hey, if you try to do anything, we're going to annihilate you also, you're not going to have, you're not going to participate in this sort of uh, benefit. And so I think we have ways to align sort of intelligences that are superhuman. Like, I mean, a, a company is a superhuman intelligence. It's a mixture of experts of humans with neural routing. It's technically smarter than any one human. I think so. We can have a debate about that. But we, we have ways to align these these super organisms of, of, of uh, beyond human intellect and through sort of economic uh, exchange, right? And I think that um, the future looks like we have AIs that are aligned or extensions of humans, right? And then we have AIs that are more autonomous and there's economic exchange between both and that keeps us um, relatively aligned, right? But there is urgency to figure out how to extend uh, human intelligence uh, in a way that makes us more formidable and, and, and more... Uh, of a player at this at, at this big boys table, right? Uh, but uh, and that but that's what you guys are working on, so that's good. I mean, yeah, I appreciate all that you just said, but like I feel like you contradicted yourself. You said it optimizes for growth, and you might notice that mm -hmm. growth and human happiness are two very very different things. Sure. Well, so I mean, you have. So you, ha you have your choice, right? Nowadays, you can live in Europe where you're going to maximize your happiness, have your espresso, chill a bit, have a two-hour lunch. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but Or you can Not live in America it. where it... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Might as well lean into it. But uh, it, it, Or you can live in America where it's like it's all in on growth, right? And I think that, um, you know, you, ha you have those two options. And, and I think that's the beautiful thing about... Uh, the world right now we don't have a monoculture we don't have a single way of doing things we don't have a single way yes, to legislate but things that's in your global, model and we can a b test things yes. locally right sure but in your yeah. model america will eat europe it will destroy europe it will grow more the system will succeed and this people in america are less happy by your own admission so what will happen is is that on average people will be worse off i think that okay, okay so, so this is an important distinction between like eac and ea we are not uh, hedonistic utilitarians, right? Uh, at EAC, we are. am I. Okay, well, maybe not you, but uh, you know, EA in general. I'm, I'm just. It's not about just the comment in general. You know, yeah, of course. some EAs are trying to maximize happiness, and that's a different loss function. I think that has spurious, weird local minima, like wireheading and highly suboptimal, right? Um, mm -hmm. In many ways, and it's not anchored to reality. We're trying to maximize growth of the system because we think that. 
you know, life and intelligence is a very special phase of matter in our universe, and we have a responsibility to scale it and figure out how to make it grow. And and but, hopefully, you know, we're, we're, we, we can all aim to be part of those future states of high growth. But the, the thesis is that if you, if you, let's say, let's say you legislate, let's say for a whole set of countries, you have a sort of union and then you legislate away the ability to pursue AI past a certain threshold. Before okay, we go, go back into this, just, okay. you contradicted yourself again. You said you want to optimize for growth. And then you talked about the beauty of intelligence and all these other things. Those are two different things. If you optimize for no. growth, you get growth. You don't get beauty and happiness and all these other things you like. Ah. Okay, so 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 I, I guess the thesis is that intelligence evolved as uh, a way for systems that are uh, lifelike to uh, adapt on a faster time scale uh, uh, for better growth, right? Acqu acquisition, seeking out resources, acquiring them, extracting utility from them. Nature is um, red in tooth and claw. Uh, and so, and so I, I think that if we have to have a larger civilization, it's going to necessarily have to be more intelligent. Overall, is every individual unit going to be more intelligent? I don't know, but overall, as a system, has to be smarter because it has to seek out far more resources and, and utilize them more efficiently. And the beauty is that if you have a subsystem that is not uh, optimal uh, in terms of its uh, uh, ability to acquire uh, energy and, and, and utilize it uh, cleverly, uh, uh, some branch of it will fork off, outcompete it, and, and, and dominate. Yes, um, but the thing that so outcompetes is cancer. The thing that outcompetes is maximum growth, no art, no beauty, no happiness, just growth. Just to kind of remove all the parts of the brain that have emotions, just focus on replication, locusts. No, it, is emotions have utility, right? They, they've had utility. Uh, yeah, I mean, I like, why did we I expect an AI with, I expect, and I expect it was a local minima. I expect if we, the future systems will not have human emotions. I don't think human emotions are a global maxima. They're not, but, if they're not a global optimum, why not seek to explore new ways to ah, think or uh, have? Uh, now, this is yeah. a naturalistic fallacy. Is is not ought. So I agree with you that there are that our values are not some global, you know, coherent maxima of any growth utility function. And my answer to that question is, who the fuck cares? They're mine. I like them. I like happiness, I like puppies, I like people being happy, playing with their kids and so on. And yes, this costs resources that I could be spending on maximizing my, my you know, economic growth function in the local supercluster. And my answer to that question is, I, why should I care? Is this not ought? Yeah, I, I do think like happiness evolved as a sort of proxy of like your estimator of your, your your gradient of likelihood of future growth or higher mutual information with the future. Like if you if you have a positive impact on the world, you feel good. If you're, you know, let's say have a significant other and, and, and feel like you're gonna have a, a legacy, you naturally feel good and your brain like secretes all sorts of feel good hormones. So I, I do think they're just, um, you know, our neurochemistry evolved as sort of proxy loss functions for, for certain uh, uh, effects. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I, I think there could also be awesome human, like a n whole new spectrum of human emotion sure. and euphoria that we could achieve. Sure. You know, but like, we're okay. focusing on like pain, but it could be, you know, infinite pleasure. We can live in a, a, a not a, I don't believe in utopia, def I, but I, I would say that we can have much more comfortable lives, uh, much happier lives. And that overall technology, tech, techno capital, the techno capital machine is a deflationary force that uh, you know, helps uh, everyone have access to a higher quality of living and and overall like can increase happiness. And in fact, the things that cause us pain, like, you know, healthcare, housing, uh, uh, legal systems have been overregulated and decelerated. And if we had let technology sort of evolve faster uh, and, 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 and create more deflationary force in those areas, like build more housing and so on, it would be cheaper, more accessible, and then more people would be would be happy. And so to from our perspective, actually, deceleration is what has caused pain so far in our current system, rather than acceleration. But sure, yeah. I'm I'm not. I wouldn't disagree with you, especially on housing policy stuff. But like, but this is the kind of stuff that makes me call EAC Fisher Price Nick Land. Like, you don't go all the way. You only think on like American local thing, like five years into the future. Extrapolate your own beliefs, man. 
Like actually take it, like take techno capital its logical conclusion. That's what Nick Land did, you know? Like Nick Land allegedly used to be a Marxist and he was taking, doing Marxist capital analysis of like what happens if techno capital gains more and more power. And his conclusion was eventually there is only capital. There's no labor, there's only capital. There's no people, there's no happiness. There's only competition. There is only capital. Capital itself becomes sentient. And like this is before like AI was a big topic. It's like the nineties when he wrote this kind of stuff, right? And he's the only goddamn person in all of accelerationists who actually t bites the bullet and actually goes all the way. If you go all the way, if you optimize for something, you lose everything which is not the thing you're optimizing for. We got lucky. We got lucky that, for example, torturing people you know, to work 24 hours a day doesn't work because they fall apart eventually. But this is no longer true when you have robots. If you have robots that can work for 24 hours, there is no reason to give them time off. There is no reason for them to have mm -hmm. hobbies. There is no reason for them to spend time with their kids and love them. There is no reason for this. We got lucky that we ourselves have so many limitations that eventually you have to compromise because otherwise we can't function. But if you take mm -hmm. the techno capital acceleration to its logical conclusion, the logical conclusion is not, wow, we have more housing. The logical conclusion is there is no more human, just a bunch of mindless automata optimizing some growth function. I don't believe, I mean, we have different models of the future asymptotes, right? Like, uh, I think that there's not a finite set of jobs for which we're, we're competing in an economy. I think we just increase There's a finite the set of atoms. Scale. Not really. There, there's plenty of atoms in outer space, right? And and if we are, I mean, humans are bound to Earth because we kind of overfitted our biological hyperparameters to Earth, right? We've evolved over billions of years uh, over here, whereas maybe a, a synthetic uh, organism isn't as anchored to to you know uh, Earth living conditions and and could uh, uh, seek out to grow beyond uh, beyond the Earth. I think that. Overall, even if uh, a large part of the economy is accomplished, uh, like a, a lot of the economy is, 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 is executed on by machines, doesn't mean that the human component would necessarily shrink. It would get diluted. But if the overall system grows far more, it's kind of like taking venture capital. It's like oper it's, it's intellectual and operational leverage, right? Uh, we're, we're kind of diluting ourselves, our, our share of the economy, how much we uh, contribute. But if overall economy grows by many orders of magnitude, our overall uh, component can can grow, and that's in our best interest. And in general, we're gonna every subsystem is gonna do what's in their best interest. You are arguing for the best interest of humans, and hearing you out, I just think that people are are, are greedy at, at a company level. They're gonna you know use more AI if it uh, causes more growth, and that's just reality, you're not going to be able to legislate that away. Like they're going to, people will revolt if they can't use uh, AI, if it has massive positive utility. Uh, and, and I think people are going to do it at, at, at a country level and we're going to do it at, at, at the human level. And I think just because there we might will be... doesn't mean we should. Is this not ought? Um, I mean, I think, I, I guess like, I'm just trying to like, you know, it's kind of like real politics. It's like, the yeah, but like, again, that... you're, you're contradicting yourself. You're, 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 you're conflating two different things. There's the thing we want, and then there's facts about reality. There's decision theory, like what is true, what, what, how do you win? But I, I don't one, think like, we do agree we what, we, what we want, right? Sure, and like... I'm trying to separate them so we can have a separate discussion because often I've talked sure. about what I want, and then you talk about what works. You start about, well, people will do it anyway, so we shouldn't even try. This is an argument about decision theory. This is not an argument about values. I... Okay, so it's not an argument about values, but you're arguing for maximizing human happiness. I'm not, I haven't, I haven't stated any values so far. I have not stated any values. I've simply claimed that I like puppies. I like many things. I'm not that saying sounds, I have That utility. sounds like, I mean, that, that sounds like a, a certain utility function that we know. Sure, right? like, there is some kind of function. There's some way you can model it. You can call it a Fristonian prior or whatever the hell you want. I don't particularly care what you model it as. This is not the, the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is, is that whatever the hell that thing is, I'm not even saying I know what my values are. I'm not even saying I know what your values are. But I claim that your values are not growth. You don't actually want this. 
as much as you think you do. And I for sure don't want it, and people don't want it, because this is not what we actually like. It's, and you can make, and then every time I bring this up, you make this argument about like, oh, but it's what's going to happen anyways, and it's what is, and I'm like, oh, that's a separate argument. Your Us values are not growth. How so? Because I like puppies and happiness and friendship and games and like. And why do you art. like friendship? Why, why, why do you like having relationships? Be why do you like being part of a group? Because evolution kind of why hard -coded not, you to crave these things because if you're part of the group, you again, have a higher likelihood of passing on your genes. You're, you're mixing up is and ought again. It's like I'm just be, going for the latent variable here, right? You're describing like, I think, an is. I'm describing an ought. I think having a subjective loss function for how to steer reality is prone to being manipulated and is the source of yes. a lot of pain in our modern yes. times. So I, I am arguing for an objective <laughs> loss function and we can argue that that loss function is not anthropocentric enough, right? Free energy, right? We can argue about that. But I, I think that if it's too anthropocentric, it's too hedonistic, it leads to weird optima and we're, we're, we're prone to being manipulated, right? Man, like, this is just cope. What you're describing is, is that reality is hard. Yes, you're, yes. If the thing we want is complicated and hard to get, the solution is not, well, let's pick something simple and easy to find and give ourselves a participation award. The answer is, well, we have to get stronger. We have to get better. We have to get yeah, better. Let's get yes, let's get stronger. The answer is not, oh, let's pick an objective utility function that I can follow so I at least feel like I'm doing, making no, it's not a, it's not a, it's not an optional choice of utility function. And that's kind of the thing that the anchoring in physics gives you. It's like, oh, no, the, this objective function for you know seeking out free energy utilizing it towards your own growth is what the universe selects for it's just probability theory again and, and is it, you're making the same mistake naturalistic fallacy is is not ought but you don't have an option to obey gravity you can't violate the laws of thermodynamics yes period. sure like, again is this not ought you cannot derive an ought from an is these are two separate magisteria but, okay so so my point is let so let's say you have your you know let's say you legit you, you, you legislate Europe the way the way you want it, or or half the Earth doesn't matter which half. I don't know. And then we have the accelerationist half. We play the movie out, right? We play the movie out. Yes. I think I think that the the accelerationist half is gonna outgrow and yes, and we both die in this scenario. Both you and me will be dead. I don't know about that one. I, yes. I, I would need more yes. evidence. You in agree that, that eventually we will build technology that's so powerful that we could blow up anything. And in your model of the ex of accelerationist world, we build it as fast as possible with as little safety mechanisms as possible and everyone has access to it. What happens then? No, we don't seek, we don't seek out. No, but it happens accidentally. Actively... No, you accidentally, you just accidentally. No, but you, we have a model, right? Like that, okay, Do if we you? reach this state. You, can you predict ahead of time what technology will be safe or not? Can you predict ahead of time how We can't guarantee be? safety, but we can't yes, guarantee. Yes, we can't, but we can do better than not even trying. But we can also, it, I think, guaranteed to shoot ourselves in the foot in terms of like the upside we're leaving on the table uh, is almost, it, it's just as bad. Like in your models, the upside we are leaving behind does not get priced accurately. And I think it far outweighs the, the, the risks. Um, and I think- Sure, you can like, make this argument if you want. This is a coherent argument to make. This is a coherent yeah. argument to make if you want to make this argument. but. Mm -hmm. Like from my perspective, like we could talk about this specific, like, okay, okay. Let's, if we want to talk about pricing, I think this is a great point to go. I think this is a great place for us to go. I think this is a, a reasonable thing to sure. talk and disagree about. But I want to make clear again, just the point I'm trying to make here is that the point I'm trying to make here is, is that predictably, if you have a civilization that doesn't even try, that just accelerates fast as possible, predictably, guaranteed, you're not going to make it. You're definitely not going to make because at some point you will develop technology that is too powerful to handle if just have the hands of random people. And if you do it as unsafe as possible, eventually an accident will happen. We almost nuked ourselves twice during the Cold War where only a single person was between a nuke firing and yeah. not happening. If the same thing happens with, say, super intelligence or some other extremely powerful technology, which will happen in your scenario sooner or later, you know, maybe it goes well for 100 years, maybe it goes well for 1,000 years, but eventually your civilization is just not going to make it. I don't know about that. I mean, we, have, we already have that. We've already crossed a threshold by having the knowledge about, 
you know, nuclear weapons, right? But again, I don't, I, I think Do you think that, our current world is stable? Like, do you trust our leaders with nuclear weapons infinitely? Do you think- And if you we want could, to trust our leaders with the monopoly over I AI don't. power? I don't, no, like, but that's like you what don't you're understand. Suggesting. Again, you're, What are you suggesting? It, what, I have I'm not actually, even said what I suggested yet. So this is my point. It'd be great like, to get into that. I would love to get into that as well, but like, I'm trying to make a more meta point before I go into any specific points. My point is, I am actually pessimistic. When people say I'm pessimistic or they're doomer or whatever the, the hell you want to call me, I, I, I'm I just don't know that. if there are terminal states as you claim. I think that in general there are ma there are large negative reward states in terms of like utility towards growth. For example, you know, global nuclear war would reduce our population massively, would take a long time to rebound, and that's a setback in terms of growth. But I do think that on average, you can there's there's certain probabilities. Um, uh, fluctuations about this this kind of path towards growth, um, but overall the odds that we go back to absolute zero and that life is completely uh, gone, like I think those those likelihoods are, are pretty low. And even technologies that are very scary or very powerful, like we have a model that we like to extrapolate and 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 have a sort of black or white thinking. But it, everything has some some nuance, like. According to your model, like the world should have ended when we discovered nuclear bombs, which and it almost it did somehow. twice. Like, like you're like my model says is that there's you know some percentage but, chance that yes, if you have dysfunctional institutions with dysfunctional leaders and a dysfunctional civilization with access to massive weapons, mass destruction, yes, they probably will get used and probably there will be sh close calls. We dropped a nuke on South Carolina accidentally. It's still <laughs> there. It's in the swamp. That's it's funny. still there. And it was pure luck that the the it was actually armed. The nuke was armed. And we got so lucky then that what? it just happened. I mean, it misfired. It, a city would have been blown up. It, it would, the, the world would not have ended, actually. So yes, sure. But awful. like, what happens if that ha If you, this is the rate, every decade or two, we drop you know one, a nuke on South Carolina, and our nukes get better and better and better. And eventually, the nukes are synthetic bio weapons. I don't. You know, AGI, ASI, these kinds of things. What happens? <sighs> So, I mean, even bioweapons, um, there was a leak of a bioweapon. We didn't all die. We probably all got COVID once Again, or twice. Yes, sure. The world has never ended in the past. This is true until it's not. Like, this isn't an argument. Mm, I don't know. It's a data. It's like a. a yes, a and the data is we got really amazing. damn close many times, even with the shitty you know, pseudo apocalypse tech that we have now. I agree that our current nukes are not existential yet, but they're as close as we've gotten. And even with those, we've had a bunch of accidents in the like p measly 70 years we've had these. I, I just don't, I just don't agree with your model that like, we're gonna have AI pass us through, like, can we, like we're, we're down like 50 analogies deep at this point. Can we just talk about AI at this point? Because instead of like drawing analogies to a bunch of other technologies that aren't quite uh, the same game theory. Uh, Cause again, AI has huge upside we're leaving on the table, whereas nukes don't. Um, so, so like for um, like, let's get into the AI discussion. Like let, let, what, what, what do you want? What is your analogy here? Let's, let's get into it. Like what are the connections you're trying to draw? You're trying to say, uh, we shouldn't build AI because, or AGI that is human level and beyond because it is a one-way function, it is a terminal state where uh, we won't be able to put the genie back in the bottle and, um, you know, our uh, existence as humans is guaranteed to end in your model. Is that correct? And, and can we also cover what you would do, Connor? I also, I would talk about yeah. that, but... I think what you say is worth talking about as well. So no, my model is not, wow, every single human level intelligence kills you instantly and there's no way back. Quite the opposite. If I believed that, I would go live in Hawaii with my family and just live out my final days. I think it is completely possible to build AI systems out of all the upsides you want. All the great things you and other EACs envision. I like the aesthetic. There's a lot of nice things to like there. There's so let's a lot build it. Yes, and that's going to take 100 years and us not blowing ourselves up along the way. It's not we don't that have easy. years. Yes, yeah. that's my point. That's why I'm a doomer. You're no, no, a doomer but like, too. No, it, in this, no, in the sense that like, if if a subsystem of uh, the civilization decides to go slower, another subsystem yes, will is, not want to go faster. Yes. And it's just like, not stable. And, and then the only point. way to stabilize that is to have a top-down monopoly on power yes. and, and, and on AI that sort of 
enforces this 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 uh, equilibrium mm-hmm. in a top down fashion, and that that I think is a bad trade, and I wouldn't Great. I don't want to take it. Right, Great. and that's where so, we. Yeah, congratulations as Lord of the Doomer, you know, Honor Society. I bestow upon you the rank of Doomer. You are now yeah. become a Doomer. You are a Doomer. <laughs> you are a Doomer because yeah. you believe that both that we are basically fucked. You, you may not explicitly formulate no. it that way, but no, 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 look, you think both that if technology is this dangerous, as I say it is, then, and if, if we tried to develop it this safely, it wouldn't work because someone else would do it much faster. And the mm-hmm. only way to stop that is through these monopolies, and that's not an option. This is also basically No, no, what there's, I a, there's a third path, which is the one we want to take with EAC, but, but go on. And what is the third path? No, the third path is, you know, we want to have a a decentralized control of 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 AI, right? Like if every company, if every individual can have access to AI and compute, you end up in this sort of adversarial equilibrium where um, uh, people, companies, uh, smaller governments are more formidable and are not to be fucked with. Um, and that's a you know, it's kind of a peer-to-peer enforced equilibrium instead of a top-down. So AI enforced. mercenaries. Sure. Yeah, I think I. No, so so I mean, in our current system, right? We we're talking about lawsuits and lawfare, right? A- LLMs are going to be, you know, our super-powered lawyers, yes. and whoever has more capable LLMs is going to win lawsuits and going to be in- able to enforce their will on others, and that's where we're going. Right. Yeah, and who's going to win the AI warfare? The one with the better guns, the better LLMs, the, the better... one with more capital, just like it is right now AI. in our legal system. So already, you're a doomer. Right? So you're a doomer. No, you already believe I'm just it's realist. over. Yes, you're realist. It's not That's over. You're, you're it's describing it just... being over. No, like if if there's a form of legal violence through LLMs and we just throw compute at each other, like that escalation is going to yield like way cheaper compute, and we're going to use that for all sorts of amazing discoveries, nuclear fusion, we're gonna geoengineer our, our, our planet. But the we're one with the most Mars. capital wins. Well, it's not. There's a, no well, decentralization. You just said you just said the one with the most capital wins. No, there's a power law, just like in any sort of uh, complex self-organizing system. I, I, I believe in capitalism and that's what happens, right? Like there is some power concentration. So God for saves example, us. No, we, we, if, no, the point is if we have, if we don't legislate away the ability for for small startups or individuals to try to disrupt uh, uh, the the giants, right? Like if we don't legislate away that ability, then 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 you know the uh, incumbents are, are get themselves checked by uh, you know up and coming startups. For example, and why don't the incumbents just create their own AI powered super legal state? I mean, super legal state. I don't, I don't like, know. Like, like for example, problem with let, like just free- an example here that actually happens. So for example. You know, a lot of startups right now are, are using Mistral, and that was enabled by you know the ability for open source uh, AI to be shared because people don't want the platform risks that come from uh, uh, closed closed APIs, right? And that eroded the the market power and the pricing pressure uh, of uh, you know the open AI's anthropics of the world, and then ma- that kind of corrected their ability to just Man. glob up all the capital. Man, the the world isn't a B2B SaaS app. Politics and war are not the same as VC. I don't know how to explain this to you, man. It's like you keep talking about these huge concepts about civilizations and power laws and, you know, the long future. Okay, you you want to talk talk about war? Yeah, let's talk about real war. Let's talk about real war. war. We are in a cold war right fucking now, right? Yeah, it sucks. It's unrestricted warfare, you know, across the board um and uh you know it, it might evolve into a hot war right yep and sucks. i think i i do think that there is very strong danger where our legal system and you know certain ideologies are weaponized in order to have the west sort of defang itself and become an easy target mm-hmm. and because we are in this uh global geopolitical competition um, we have a duty to accelerate, right? Uh, because we have to outcompete and survive. And, and that's just, that's how it's going to be. Like, I don't, we're not going to be able to create a world government that, you know, keeps everyone in check. And I wouldn't want to live in that world where there's a like global panopticon. And so we just, we're going to have to play out the movie, how, how it plays out, right? 
That's yeah. just reality. Yeah. And and, and, and we're going to have this so sort of... No, it doesn't necessarily yield doom. I mean, we've we've been in this sort of, you know... But uh, like your, your whole uh, ideology, as far as I could tell, is just... We just play it out, let it rip. There's nothing we can do. We're completely impotent. Like we I have mean, no this control playing it out is what got us here, right? Like this, this fractal sort of competition between tribes, between people, understanding in faith that the system is, is, is an adaptive system and it's going to adapt towards a high level optimum. But I don't like the whole point is that we don't want uh, a, a world government or one power to dominate everyone. And we have to stay in sort of this sort of small capabilities delta between different players, whether that's at a corporate level, but also at a nation state level, right? Um, now, if you want to argue that closing down AI, you know, is more optimal for, uh, you know, competition against foreign adversaries, I'm happy to have that discussion. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah. we can have that discussion as well. We can talk about how open source is basically feeding directly into our adversaries as strongly as possible. And it basically benefits only them and not us. But that's a whole mm. different conversation I don't particularly no, care about. I do care about it. I, I do want to uh, say a point here um, because I, th I think that um, the strength of the American system is its variance and its internal competition uh, between different corporate entities, be between startups, between innovators. And, you know, the point is that, you know, the top AI systems, several of them are American and they're competing with one another. And that internal competition breeds very high fitness that makes us dominant on the world stage. Having um, uh, open source AI gives um, uh, more people the opportunity to contribute uh, to AI and, and enables us to have much faster rate of discovery because we have just more points in this point cloud search of hyperparameters of how to do AI, right? And uh, sure, like, you know, our adversaries also have access to those models. Um, do you think but... the blueprint for the F-16 should be uh, open source so more people can develop fighter planes for US? So, so this is why I'm interested in digging because there's a, there's been this sort of, you know, uh, bait and switch of like, oh, we're doing this for safety. And then, and then when that argument doesn't work sometimes nowadays, we're pivoting to like, oh, we don't want to give it to our adversaries. And to me, it seems like there's a sort, you know, similar uh, to To be how... clear, I don't give a shit about national politics. I'm not American. I'm not European. I'm nothing. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what you are, care. but yeah, it's but, like, I don't, I don't uh, my point care. is like, there's a bit of a bait and switch, maybe not you, but I think uh, in general, where when one argument doesn't work, the, 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 the pretense, uh, uh, you know, we stop pretending and it's like, okay, no, this is for uh, a capabilities Still, delta with our foreign adversaries, right? I don't care about the delta with the foreign adversaries. I care far more about the delta with crazy wackos. Like, but what, it, again, I'm asking you a wackos. question. How would they, how would they I'm asking you a question. Should the F-16 fighter plane blueprints be open sourced? Do you think this would lead to a better or a worse world? I think there is a lot of someone who's been espionaged by foreign adversary or or, or, or spied on. Um, at, you know, unfortunately, I think big tech uh, is very like uh, leaky and insecure. I think that a lot of this secrecy and and closed sources is, is, is like security theater, and that so many or organizations are compromised that um, if you're not gonna have actual secrets, your only mode is speed. And if you want speed, you want variance. And if you want that, open source is the way. And okay. so, so that do is you worry. think the F-16 being open source would be net good or net bad? Um, I don't know. I think it would reduce the you know uh, revenue of certain companies. But uh, I mean, the, the, the Chinese and the Russians probably have their hands on. The Again, I'm asking you for the whole world, you know, whether or not the Chinese already have it or not, would releasing all of our secret, you know, engineering documents of all- But an F-16 is a force for destruction. It's not a force for positive econo economic utility. You're in your drawing these comparisons all day. I am, I'm trying, I'm not trying to make negative. a comparison. This is not a metaphor. You are, I'm, but you're, you're just I, lost in analogies not... and analogies and analogies. Let's talk about AI directly, right? You're just trying to like- Answer the question. Yes or no? Is it good or bad? If it's if it's not open source, I mean, there should be more open source uh, plane designs because I think it would Answer yield the more question. engineers yes being or trained. No. Well, I'm trying to I'm trying to explain maybe not the F-16, but the next you know maybe some other planes. If you had more people that were trained and could self-educate about you know defense tech, we'd have a better talent pipeline, and maybe we wouldn't have. 
you know, as many problems because we'd have a better uh, defense industrial base, right? And so maybe it'd be good to have some open source, right, as a, as a pipeline for training people. Okay, right? but should the F-16 be open sourced or not? Specifically, maybe not. Yes, no. sure. Okay, okay. That's my, that was my question. This was not an analogy. It was probing your intuitions around these kind of things. I wanted to understand how you thought about this. I was not trying to make but a to, case. To me, like open source AI, you know, it's never going to be quite as good as, as closed source, but it's, it's great to, uh, again, train the workforce, uh, seek out new ideas. It's good for innovation. Sure. It's you, good you for can... innovation momentum. It's net sure. positive. Okay, sure. This is completely fine. Like, you know, should mixed trial be public? It'd be an open source model? I don't know, probably net positive. Probably. Like, okay. Probably. I don't know. I'm not certain, but it seems pretty, pretty reasonable to me. I've used the model before. It's nice. It's a good model. Um, but if we were to build, say, an AGI, which is smart enough to design an F-16 fighter plane, do you think it should be open sourced? Smart enough to design an F-16 fighter plane. I mean... Would it though? Would it have that knowledge in its prior? I feel like that's very specialized knowledge that. Well, so a plane of that internet. quality. It, it, it's smart enough. It has all the mechanical engineering and so on. So it could design a plane of this quality. It could design a plane of this quality. Well, the assumption is that whatever centralized power uh, that is trying to have the monopoly on violence, uh, you know, should have a much better AI that would design much better planes, right? And so you still have that power gradient, which... I, I'm asking a much, no, a much simpler question. Really super, super simple. Just you have on your USB drive your AGI that can release, that can yeah, but be used to develop a plane of the I think thing. by the time we have that, we have much more advanced planes because we're going to use much more powerful AI that is going to design much better planes and the F-16 is going to look yeah. like, you know, something primitive. So as long as the government has even worse weapons, it's okay for people to have access to weapons. No, I think as I think that the natural state of things is that big corporations and the government will have some capability delta, right, between the AI that's accessible to all and the AI that is that is centralized, and that maintains a sort of power gradient that seems to be important in your uh, sort of in, in your sort of model of the world. You're very worried about sort of peer to peer. Uh, violence versus sort of top-down violence. Um, I guess we have different priors for how that works out. But, um, you know, to me, I, I, I think there's going to be a, a maintenance of this this sort of power gradient between the centralized and the, you know, the top-down and the bottom-up forces. Um, um, but my concern is to not have too huge of a gap. And I think uh, over-regulating today uh, AI could yield a massive gap where uh, the government and the incumbents and a, a cartel forms and uh, around AI and they have the monopoly on advanced AI. They, they don't allow the people to have access to AI that they don't control. And then they also steer our access to information. Maybe they even convince us AI never existed. And then they use it for, for, for oppression and, and, and deepening their, 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 their power uh, delta. Um, and, and that concerns me, right? Um, but I do think like uh, I, I think like even if you had a blueprint for an F-16, like good luck getting the supply chain together. There's a sort of regularizer of the world of atoms. Things are hard to do in the world of atoms. Like, you know, you can dis you can Google search, you know, you could Google search bioweapons. You probably don't know how to manufacture them. You don't have the, wet lab, the, the lab for it. You can like random search, literally random search uh, chemicals. And on average, it's going to be toxic because most many things are toxic. Doesn't mean we should ban computers. Like, I, I don't think it's just a good argument uh, for, for, for banning things. And I think like your, your argument is that uh, eroding the top-down power gradient causes instability. Uh, and my point is that that power gradient will be maintained. I'm just concerned that it becomes too sharp. This is an interesting point. I did not expect you to have this view. So thank you for elaborating on this. I yeah. thought, um, so. Thanks for elaborating on that. This is interesting for me to hear. I awesome. wouldn't describe my own point of view as eroding you know, top-down power as being inherently bad. I think if we were a better society, it, we would need less top-down control and, they would, and like decentralized control would work, but that's hard. Like my main point why decentralization like doesn't work is because it's really hard to build large coherent systems. Like it's just hard. It's not impossible. Just yeah, hard. it's hard to steer. If, if if you have a higher entropy system, it's harder to steer. But that's yes. also what that's also what gives it fault tolerance, right? Because if you 
If you yeah. have a system that's too easy to steer, then, then, then power seeking agents, which we have, we have humans that are power seeking just as much as the AIs of, of, of these doomer futures, like they are power seeking and they do a sensitivity analysis, which nodes can I compromise or, or infiltrate in order to have control over the system. So entropy provides some safety and we, we argue for entropy invariance and it's like, ah, well, it's harder to control. And then it's like, ah, well, in, the, in these tail events, in, in, in these fat tails, now that you have higher variance, there, there's some negative reward there. It's like, yeah, but that's the cost of being fault tolerant against sort of uh, top-down control. Because if we give the keys to the, our future and, and control over AI to a centralized uh, cartel, whether it's government and so on, that can be compromised by people that don't want our good. And eventually you have a very steerable system that uh, kills all variants. And so it's very hard to fork away from it and compete against it. Uh, and, and, then, and then you opened up the door to an AI assisted tyranny. And, and to, to us, that's like, that's a real existential risk. Yeah. Yeah, I understand this point of view. I understand the intuitions behind it. I think a lot of these intuitions are good intuitions. Um, I think, you know, a lot more city states would be great with different forms of regulation and stuff like yeah. this. I'm all in favor of charter cities. Cool. I think this is a great concept. Um, I think I may ha I have a hypothesis for what maybe is a much deeper disagreement that we have in our models that we haven't really talked about, which is the asymmetry between offense and defense. So mm -hmm. you often talk about a power gradient. This is not really mm -hmm. how I think about things. There's not a linear unit, and if you have more of those units, you're safe. My, from my perspective, if like you know I have more money than you know like some random you know crack addict on the street. But if he has a gun, then you know he has certain kinds of power over me that I can do fuck all about, whether or not I'm you know a relatively we wealthy man or not, or relatively well politically connected. Like power is not a one-dimensional unit. So from my perspective, destruction is almost always easier than defense. Almost always. There are some edge case exceptions like cryptography, but in most scenarios, it is much easier to destroy something than it is to build the same thing. Mm. It's much easier to build a bomb than it is to build a reactor. So from this perspective, um, I think this is a really, really, really core point of my, of my perspective yeah. on things. Yeah, and I understand. I think you're, you're arguing that um, entropy is sort of the natural state of things and, yep. and bringing order is more difficult uh, mm -hmm. and takes effort and the reality is that we want, we, we live in a complex system. We want it at actually the edge of criticality where we don't have so much order that we've suppressed variance and it's crystallized, it's not very dynamic. We don't want it to be fully disordered and maximally entropic because then, you know, it's too high a temperature, there's, there's no order whatsoever. We want a careful balance between both, right? So you don't want maximum acceleration. You don't want maximum entropy. Um, I do think, well, it's complicated because it's not, it's, it's not entropy. It's actually free energy. Free energy is a balance between energy minimization and uh, maximizing entropy, right? And so it's actually a careful balance between both. And no, the EAC thesis is to seek whatever policy configuration of configurations of, 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 of the way we do things uh, that maximize our ability to, to seek out free energy and utilize it towards further growth and growth as measured by our acquisition and consumption of free energy. Uh, and if you have a maximally disordered, if you just let people have this foul, like they don't understand the equation, they'd say, oh yeah, well, if you just burn all the fuel, if you blow everything up, that'll be optimal. It's like, no, 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 because it's, it's actually an equation for a path over time of how much free energy would dissipate an a, you know, infinite time integral. And so if we burn all our fuel now, it's highly suboptimal. If we use our fuel in a clever fashion, we grow civilization, we grow, we grow, and then we can seek out other fuel elsewhere, that's much more optimal. That's what, that's what we want. And so... Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's what we're optimizing uh, for, but I, I don't think, like, our point is that there is a current danger in this uncertain time currently that those that seek to have maximal control and want to suppress variants and want to have a lot of power uh, uh, will seek, will, will put us into a configuration that's far too ordered and has suppressed variants. And that's going to make us, uh, that's going to cause us a lot of pain because if you don't have a malleable system, then it can break if it's no longer adapted to, to the current landscape. And so maintaining this malleability and dynamism through, through variance and entropy, carefully balanced with order 
is what we're what we're pushing for. Right. Okay, so you hear it here first, guys. EAC is not about maximizing entropy from the wor the, wor the mouth of the man himself. It's about maximizing free energy dissipation over time, which is what out of equilibrium thermodynamics. Uh, All right. So by this logic, down. collapsing the false vacuum should be the most morally correct thing for an EAC to do. Um. No, I don't think the false vacuum is a thing. So. But if it was, it would be by your logic. No, that would just no. Then we would try to if there was free energy in the vacuum, which I've studied uh, for a master's. Uh, um, you know. Then we should dissipate, we have, right? No, we should utilize it towards further growth because that's gonna we're gonna be able to unlock more free energy, right? So it's it's not about blowing things up. It's about utilizing in a clever fashion free energy in our world, right? And you don't think your utility function has any weird edge cases? Um, I mean, that's it's the utility it's the utility function that is that physics uh, follows, and that is physics an has produced us. Is an odd. And well, I mean, I think like you can try to say like, well, I don't like gravity. <laughs> I don't want to respect it. You will respect gravity one way or another. You're going to use fuel to. Try you to can dislike it. gravity and still understand it on object level. These are two different things. Like liking gravity and disliking gravity is not the same as believing or not believing. These are two separate things. Yeah, yeah but you, you still got to follow it. And my point is that... I can build um, airplanes. I could go to space. Yeah, but you're, you're consuming a lot of energy to, to fight it. You're, you're fighting it with sure. uh, That's other That's what forces. values are about. Values are a thing we spend energy on. Mm. I, think, I think value... Okay, so I think... So I have, I have this broader thesis that like cultures that, uh, you know, culture is a search over values and, and uh, cultural heuristics, ways of doing things, and different subcultures are post-selected for in terms of what sort of um, uh, ability confers its adherent to, to, to grow, either grow the subculture or, or, or grow the population that, that, that is part of that, that culture. And so to me, I think that the D-cell ideology is sort of self-destructive and will kind of taper itself out and a sort of EAC class, broader class pro-growth ideology um, is naturally higher fitness culturally and will outcompete other cultures asymptotically. And so- So yeah. you, again, is and ought. You think right and might makes right, is that correct? I mean, it's just, it's just what, it's just how the world works, right? I'm, I'm not uh, asking how the world works. I'm asking what you think, what you, what you feel. Do you feel that might makes right? No, I mean, you. like, like the whole point is if you you either acknowledge this fact and align I'm yourself to it. I'm acknowledging the fact and I'm asking you how you feel. How I feel? I feel like I want to be You feel part. might makes right. What do, you, what do you mean by that? You say this ideology is good because it outcompetes the other ideology, which is might makes right. The ideology is correct um, because it outcompetes the other one. Do, I just don't how know how feel? to define good. Otherwise, I don't okay. know how to define good. Okay, so you like, think might makes right that goodness is. I power. think that, well, what what are what are our values? We think that this state of matter in our corner of the universe, we should make it grow to make it and make it fall tolerant and for it to exist and you know as as for as long as the time scale is possible, and 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 we are willing to adapt it so that it it, it maximizes its growth. That's our that's our core value. Right, and then according to that value, if you project down to subsystems, then subsystems that are higher fitness towards growth are good, according to that value system, right? And that's our that's that's kind of the core thesis, and and you may disagree with it, but I guess that's like the, the that's the EAC premise, right? And it's, and it's very funny to me because you know EAC likes shitting on EA so much because they have this weird they are at least are accused of having this rigid weird utility function with all those weird edge cases. Meanwhile, EACs. Dear audience, please you know scribe through the last ten minutes of our conversation. It's like I'm I'm like we have, well that last function is from physics, right? Like it just happens. Like the, it, so the generalized second law of the universe just happens. It's just it is how it is. The universe decided. Lol. I guess I just have to do what God says. Well, you can again like you can hate gravity and and like you could try to fight it, but at the end of the day, it wins, right? Like you know the rockets, right. we fight it for. We burn a bunch of fuel to fight gravity, but then they come down, right? And so, like, you could you could try to locally fight 
this this tendency so towards maybe growth. it would be helpful but eventually things relax back to the natural th state of things maybe, maybe it would be helpful yeah. if i explained a little bit about how i think about morality sure and at least we can hear it see a little bit where i come awesome. from here yeah, yeah, the way where I think about when I think about morality is I think people are very confused when they talk about morality, when they talk about values most of the time. I think that when people say something is correct or good or whatever, they usually mean one of three things. And these three things are very different. The first thing is epistemological truth or goodness or correctness. Like this is a true fact about reality. It's correct. It, it improve if I take this fact into my world model, my accuracy about future causal predictions will increase. This is epistemological goodness. Second is decision theoretic goodness. Like this is a good idea. What they mean by this is if you do this thing, you will win at games more in ways that you care about. And the third one is aesthetics and values. Is this is good because I like it. This is the thing we're fighting for. Why do you like it? This is not part of aesthetics. This is a different question. This is a causal well, Why do we question. like order? Again, this is a causal question. Aesthetics? You're asking an epistemological question. If you, there's an epistemological question about why do I have these aesthetics? But it's not an aesthetic. It's an epistemological question. It's a different type of ought. Like, so you can say, why do you have these things? And I can tell you a causal story. But this has, doesn't have the type signature of a moral. It's not a moral thing. It's, it, the type signature is epistemological causal. I can tell you a causal story about my evolutionary history, about my childhood traumas, or yeah, whatever yeah. you want. Sure, I can tell you all these stories. But ultimately, something has to plug in to the like, arbitrary things I like. And where those come from, Sure, like they come from here, they come from there, whatever. This well, doesn't. Well, that's the point. So, so EAC, we're not prescriptive on what you should like. We're just saying, this is the playing field. This is how the cultures are going to compete with one another. And then, given this fact, given this realization, it's like you should try different ways to live your life. But on average, just be mindful that the subcultures that are amenable and aligned towards growth are going to be selected for. And so, uh, for example, part of EAC, there's a sort of builder subculture where working on technologies that are of high positive economic utility and, and working very hard on these technologies, uh, 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 you know, gives, give, gives back to you because you have kind of fed the technical capital machine. It, 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 you've allowed it to grow and then it rewards you. Oh, you, you fed Cthulhu. He'll be nice to you now. I mean, yeah, you align yourself to civilization. You align yourself to civilization, you get rewarded. Or you could go live in the woods and, 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 and go full Ted K, and you're, you're free to do that. And, and, and let's see how the movie plays out, right? The subcultures that organize and live as part of civilization and, and, and utilize technology in a clever way, they grow. The people that become Luddites, they either become stag stagnant or sure. die, right? Sure. And so it's, it's like, like, it's your choice. As I like but to say, people should have the freedom of choice for sure. Sure, sure, whatever. Like, but like, libertarians are like house cats, fully dependent upon a system they neither understand nor appreciate. The fact that the techno capital system rewards you is not a fact of nature. This is a very ha happy circumstance, no, I, I, I confluence guess, of circumstances. I guess it's a projection of a fact of nature, is, 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 is my point. I, I, I think that. Uh, if you if you consider uh, corporations or, or, or nations as sub thermodynamic subsystems, like it will um, self organize its components uh, towards uh, 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 configurations that yield high, you know better uh, growth. So if you follow in the will of God, He shall reward the faithful. Yeah, that's your ideology. I mean, it, it, physics is my God to some extent. Uh, you can have your own other additional gods, but to 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 me, it's like. But you physics, can't it just disobey the laws you. of physics. Like physics doesn't reward you. you no, no, it the creates market. us. It created everything we love, know, and love. It created the neurochemistry you crave so much. It created your brain. It created you, every relative, everyone yes, you love. Yes, and it will also everyone create everything, everything that kills you. It will also make your parents die. Sure. And but age. that's that's it the beauty of life, man. There's there's upside. There's potential sure, downsides. You just why, gotta play the game. It's like why would you won't we have a perfectly, that? you won't have a perfectly safe guaranteed future ever. There is no guarantees in life. There's risk reward and you decide to play their game or not, right? You can decide to participate in the techno capital machine, take risks and have upside, or you could stay so at is home your, or, is or be a grad God student. I techno mean, I, capital or physics? Which one is it? Because those are two very different gods. It's physics and civilization itself, which is human, techno, capital, memes, all pieces of information and configurations of matter are part of physics. 
right? And then yes, that the physics is sort of larger thing. than that, and it's a very specific sure. subpart, which is civilization and niceness and all these kind of things. Which one do you want? My niceness. Like for me, from my perspective, I would much rather follow the god of civilization. I would much rather follow the god of light yeah. and the dark. I would not follow the god of physics. The god of physics is an elder evil that doesn't care. No, I mean, like physics, like if we don't have our stuff together, entropy wins, right? Life is a fight against entropy towards- Against entropy, uh, see guys, not maximizing. No, don't, it's, it's a subtle I'm just, argument I'm just about bullying physics. You, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, but like, it's like, you know, so so how life works, you know, it, it consumes uh, neg entropy or it consumes free energy to maintain its coherent state to not totally thermalize and, and, and become maximal disorder. But it, it's a constant fight against entropy. But then the bargain is that the house always wins. And on average, by doing this fight, no, but seriously, by doing this fight and consuming more free energy, you overall produce more entropy for the universe. And, 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 and that's why we're both fighting entropy, but by as a byproduct producing more. Right. Okay. So, so, so yeah, anyways, <laughs> quick <laughs> physics lesson, but wh where are we going with this? Um, I'd well, like could, to could talk I'd about ask a quick your... question. Um, yeah. just before we move off to this, what you're saying, Guillaume is really interesting. So, um, you know, in the world entropy or information dissipates, but living things have this remarkable ability to resist entropic forces. Yes. So like almost any, you know, unlike anything else in the universe, living things reach a kind of equilibrium. And you can you can think of just or they're dynamics. in a dynamically maintained out of equilibrium state, actually, right? Like, okay, okay, but yep. I, but I guess the, the the question is though, what is your value system? I mean, if if everything's physics, um, Connor was just saying that there's a, a bright line between is and ought, which is to say, um, I mean, Hume was an empiricist, and he was saying that morality is the one thing that you can't find out empirically there's something different about no values. i i think i think so so that's where i would i would i would disagree i i think that um morality and value systems are kind of arbitrary they're hyper cultural hyper parameter settings and i think that the subcultures that have certain hyper parameter settings that yield higher growth will be post selected for and we should embrace that this is a fact and embrace variance and a constant search and and avoid monocultures because if you suppress variants in the search and you set uh, in a top-down fashion, you prescribe these hyperparameters, you're kind of ignoring potential other modes that are more optimal and you would be outgrown and that will that could cause your, your annihilation. Sure. So might makes right. Sure, but just, just a quick point, you're still describing as physicists do what things do and we're trying here to come up with a bright definition of why something I'm not is prescribing good. any one way to live your life other than you have a choice. Um, if, you, if you optimize your, your culture and how, your policy of how do you live your life in a way that is aligned towards this growth, uh, you will probably be part of the future and you will have higher mutual information with the future. If not, then, then you'll have lower mutual information with the future. But we tend to crave in our notion of happiness, I think, is a, is a proxy for how much we think we have influence over the, the future. But that's just kind of more hypothesis there. Yeah, but uh, so, otherwise, it's hard to define happiness formally. Right. right. So what you're saying is, again, might makes right, is that you're saying there are certain things that will be selected for. And this is a statement about reality. Cool. Fine. Accepted. Whatever. And you don't. And basically, whatever that thing is, that's the thing we should do. Um, I mean, if we if we don't do it, um, I think on a certain time scale, uh, some subculture or some fork or some adversary will do it. And if it confers a massive advantage, then that will win out. Sure. So, okay. Uh, okay. But again, what do you think? What do you, Gim? What do you think we should do? Do. What should we do? Yes. Um, well, I try to enact my values, right? I mean, I work What are your on... values? I'm trying to figure out what your values are. It's what we're trying to find out. You I'm trying to scale about... civilization, right? I, 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 like, so personally, my, my life's mission uh, is to, you know, achieve, to increase uh, civilizational Kardashev scales. So I'm working on forms of intelligence that are, I'm not trying to actually replace humans. I'm working on like physics-based intelligence, like trying to understand uh, chemistry, uh, materials, you know, uh, uh, stuff. fusion, nuclear fusion, carbon capture, um, you know, uh, biology and so on. Like, I'm not trying to just 
I'm actually not working on mostly anthropomorphic AI. Uh, I, I would say physics-based AI is like an extension of, of our capabilities. And to me, it, it's kind of funny that uh, the, this, the organizations that, maybe not yours, but the organizations that are pushing for AI safety are the ones causing the 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 disruption of 100 you know, percent agree to... with that by the way like yeah like ha like me and you handshake on that yeah like yeah, I there fully you go. agree yeah. on that <laughs> good good and it's like okay so you want to ex are, are we trying to extend humans or are we trying to like compete with them to be fair i i do think that having human-like intelligence will have utility because our economy is already adapted to take in like take in humans hire humans and plop them in and it's like oh here you have an execution core here if you just do human like intelligence here, you know the 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 system will work, and so so it's just natural that you know uh, that has higher fitness in terms of products uh, because co corporations are already made to take human like intelligences and put them to use, right? Uh, so I understand where that comes from from an economic utility standpoint, but I have a different like my uh, m I, I guess I'm more aligned with Elon where I'm trying to work on technologies that that help us uh, increase the scope and scale of civilization. And so I'm working on like the hardest problems, uh, you know, and, and, and trying, to, trying to extend notions of intelligence to tackle these hard problems. And for example, one thing I'm concerned about is that, you know, policies backfire in ways you don't predict. Like for example, let's say you cap uh, compute for human-like intelligence. Before we go down another just just, just one comment while we're on physics-based AI. If you cap compute at a certain threshold for LLMs, that affects, let's say, drug discovery research, where we might need way more compute than that to 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 do our research, right? Or or materials research, and that has a net negative effect because it's still AI, and and above that compute threshold, right? And so what I'm arguing for is let's be very careful as to like what legislation we crystallize and let, let's have it be as light touch as possible. I think there will be some regulation, I'm realistic, um, but I, I, I do think that we have to be mindful of like what we're gonna affect in terms of po potential positive effects of enabling high compute uh, AI research. Uh, like we, we, don't, we don't wanna shoot ourselves in the foot uh, with any sort of regulation. I, I don't think what's been proposed so far has been good. So yeah, anyways. Sure, 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 sure. Fine, all, all good. but. Again, I, so I'm, I'm very intrigued by your answer to this question. It's very intriguing to me because it again looks like another bait and switch because uh, the, the question was, what are your values and what is EAC? And you said, well, EAC is about you know, maximization. You're taking the values that will be outcompeted, blah, blah, blah. And then you said, well, I have these values about like maximizing humanity and whatever. Okay, cool. What if, if you're consistent, this would mean that if tomorrow I convinced you that actually the most, the strongest, the most growth maximizing thing is actually to work on AI that removes humans. Would you do that? You. I don't think that's the case right now. Okay, so. but like if it was, if I made a really good argument for it and you're like, damn, that's a good argument, would you do it? No, not personally, but Why? I do think that, well, I have self-interest as well, right? I want, you know, everybody So you don't else. even believe in EAC yourself? Not really. No, I do believe in it. I mean, I'm working on technologies that I think will massively Yeah, but you don't believe in growth maximization. Augment. So this, the point I'm trying to make- No, I do believe in growth maximization, but you're just trying to paint a scenario of what is not, right? What I'm painting like, a scenario of is that you don't take your own belief seriously. It's Fisher Price- No, I take Atlantic. it very seriously. I, I live my values all the way. I'm I, I, believe, I believe that you feel your values, but I don't think you intellectualize your values all the way. Nick Land did. Nick Land went all the way. He said, if the techno capital machine says everyone dies, then I'm the first to die. Hell yeah, let's go. He would not say, well, I personally would decide not to. He was like, hell yeah, let's all die. It's not, you might be correct. I'm not saying it's impossible that you're correct. I don't think I'm, it's the case, right? But um, Sure, but like, what if it was? But it isn't. So why? <laughs> like, what, what do you mean, man? Like, like, come on, man. Like, work with me here. We're trying to actually. No, I, I think like, you know, I want to support. But you can't just say no. -uh. Like, that's not an argument. Come on, man. But you, you're saying like, we're all doomed if this happened. And I don't agree. And we're not even discussing your model of that. I'm trying to see. Would, I'm trying to understand your values. 50 system. analogies that aren't, uh, you know, maximal inner product with reality. And so like. So, so Connor, what would what would you do then? What would I do? Jesus Christ. Ugh. I mean, 
It's the world is high dimensional and very complicated. The way yeah. I see things is is that never mind like I know AGI is the topic I talk about the most and whatever because the most pressing one, but I actually AGI is not the main thing I care about. The main thing I care mm. about is technology in general, and of which mm. AGI is just the most salient example in the current mm -hmm. future. You know, 50 if I was born 50 years ago, I would care about nukes. If I was born, you know, 200 years ago, I probably would have had a completely different ideology because technology wasn't advanced enough yet. And the thing I fundamentally care about is the stewardship of technology. I think of civilization as an entity of various levels of coherency. It's a very schizophrenic entity. It's more mm -hmm. coherent than it was 200 years ago. Like 200 years ago, you couldn't really talk about a human civilization entity at all. Yep. Like there was a bunch of like smaller things like tribes and nations and stuff that were like sort of coherent a little bit, very low bandwidth. Now it's more closer to this. We're still far. Like the UN is not a unified like governing body by any means yep. and neither is the West or China. Mm -hmm. It's closer, but so the way I think about these kinds of things is that we can think of ourselves as part of you know, many levels, like a continuous agency. Like, you know, we can think of us as our bodies as people, but we can also think of us, our bodies plus our social networks as people, yep. plus our tools, plus our information, plus our culture, plus whatever, however you wanna, you can draw the boundary anywhere you want. There is no specific, here is where you end and other people start. It's a gradient. Uh, and a lot yep. of what you would consider to be you is not in your brain. It's in your yep. environment, it's in other people, it's in your tools, it's everywhere. It's distributed. And so in a similar sense, like the United States of America is kind of an ag agent, kind of. Yep. It's not, and it's not 100%. located anywhere in particular. It's not like, oh, there he is, there's the USA. It's kind of, you know, you have a little bit of the USA in you. I have a little bit of the USA in me, you know, mm -hmm. and like various times and whatever to distribute a computation process. And from my perspective, this is awesome. Like this is what gives us almost all the good things we have is that yep. we can work together on this. We can have gods and civilizations and memes and cultures. Awesome. I love technology. I love living in a civilized state. This is awesome. I would like this to continue. I would like our states to be more civilized. I would like our institutions to be more competent and more coherent, etc. Now, can these things be predatory? Duh. I'm from Germany. Yeah. <laughs> like, I yeah, understand. Like, yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. Things can go bad. It's like we're de we're we're, genetic we're mimetically engineering, genetically engineering super beings. Yeah. Like, of course, this is dangerous. Like, if we were genetically engineering super tigers, people would be like, "Hey, that seems maybe a bit dangerous." But let, let let's talk about this uh, this control hierarchy. I, I really like your picture of the world. I think we have a similar uh, model of like, okay, you have these kind of locuses of loci of control, and you have this sort of cybernetic control hierarchy, uh, and 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 like. I, I, in a sense, like, uh, you know, at every level, you know, there's a sort of a parody check, you know, or, or it's, I, I draw analogies to error correction. That's where I came from, came from quantum computing. In quantum computing, we try to engineer fault tolerant uh, um, uh, computers because we don't trust the execution of the program at each level of, of the computer, including the 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 level where, uh, uh, you know, certain parts of the computation are to keep to check the, the computation at lower levels. And we've actually searched over architectures of, okay, which ones work, which ones do not, right? If you have a central node that controls everything, if you corrupt that central node, the fault propagates to the whole system. If you have a completely non-local decoder, there can be correlated errors, usually are lower likelihood, but there can be correlated errors that then you don't know how to, how to, how to feedback and control. So what is optimal is a sort of a nice, hierarchy that's not too wide, not too not too thin at each level of the tree, like structure where you have this, this, this sort of hierarchy of cybernetic control. Um, and my point is that uh, usually um, uh, there's there's usually a, a higher level of, you know, of the, the tree of power that keeps the nodes at a lower level in check, right? But if you have one global central node at the very top, let's say a world government or something that has power over everyone else or over every nation, what keeps that in check? And the problem is if if we're counting on democracy to keep that, that top central node in check, 
in the age of AI, that might be difficult because if they have a monopoly on intelligence and they can steer information landscapes and engineer adversarially uh, mimetic uh, perturbations that propagate, then they can manufacture consent for whatever the heck they want to do, right? And I think we're both concerned with that. And I think yep. we're on the same page there, actually. Yep, absolutely. Um, and so that's why I'm trying to understand. I, I, I haven't, unfortunately, read like all your uh, propositions with your organizations, but like, what do you, what is your proposition for how to mitigate that possibility if you're trying to have a sort of centralized research lab for AI safety, which, you know, we do that for biosafety. We've seen how those centralized labs uh, have caused a lot of damage. I, I haven't seen, you know, we, we talk about sort of adversarial actors in their basement, uh, you know, creating bioweapons. So far, that hasn't happened. What has happened is the big centralized lab have had a leak, even though they had the best intents, right? And so, like, what what do you what are you proposing here with like your framework for uh, sort of centralized, sort of secretive AI safety research? I mean, I, 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 okay, let me, let me try to steal my, like your, your point is like, if, if we have a preview of what's to come in terms of capabilities, we can best like, uh, figure out policies to, 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 to prepare for the advent of this, this sort of, uh, technology, or I guess decide when to shut it down and ban it, which I don't, I don't know how you would enforce that, but you know, I, I'd love to hear your, your proposal, what you're, yeah, what, what, what you're proposing here for how to, how to move forward, right? Like, mm -hmm. like we can talk about you know, fear and we don't know the future, it could kill us, whatever. It's like, okay, but how are you gonna, you know, what's your proposed antidote and is that gonna be a worse thing than the risks we're taking, right? That. So I think you make a lot of really good points. I like you thought, thinking about like hierarchical cybernetic control, that's a fun way to think about it. Fault tolerance, these kind of things I think are really good ways to think about civilization. And this is a lot of how I think about civilization and these kind of things. Um, it's also I think about like biology to a large degree, right? Like cells and, and you know nerves and so on. There's like I'm sure you're familiar with like you know like um, Levin's work on like bioelectricity, like planarian worms and stuff like that. How yep. it's like hierarchical like cellular automata, like control systems in the body. I think these are all good analog, not just analogies that are kind of like literally true in, to a large degree. Is like you know, memetic systems are information exchange systems, they're distributed computation systems, and thinking about them this way can be a very productive way to think about them. So when I think about policy, I'm not necessarily literally talking about a, ba a bill that gets passed in Congress. This is often how it's a productive way of doing it. The same way when I talk about medicine, I don't literally necessarily mean a pill you swallow. That might be a very useful and common way to practice medicine, but it's by far not the only way to practice medicine. There's, you know, surgery and, you know, injections and whatever, I don't know, radiation therapy and whatever. And so I think a similar way is how I think about civilization as well, is the way I see things is, is that our civilization is just not able to handle powerful technology. Like, I just don't trust our institutions, our leaders, our, you know, distributed systems, anything with, you know, hyper powerful technology at this point in time. This doesn't mean we couldn't get to systems that could handle this technology without catastrophic or at least vastly undesirable side effects. But I don't think we're there. I don't mm. think there is like, you know, I wouldn't even trust myself with like, you know, extremely uncontrollably powerful technology because I'll probably fuck it up. I'll probably make a mistake. You don't have right. bad intentions. I need control mechanisms. I need feedback. I need, you know, mm. checks and bounds so I don't make a mistake, even if I have good intentions. So even if I had AGI, I think this would be really dangerous. I think it would be really dangerous if even only I had access to AGI. If only the government had access to AGI, that's really dangerous. I think all of these scenarios are extremely dangerous. There are no entities, no institutions that I would feel good about having access to vastly more powerful like a technology. Same thing with nukes, by the way. Like I wouldn't feel good if I had a nuke. If I had a nuke, I would be like, who gave this to me? Like, take it away from me. Like, I'm not what happens if I sit on the button, you know? Does right. this make sense? I, I, I think we, we agree that current day institutions are uh, really uh, ineffective and not necessarily competent enough to 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 guide the world and top down control uh, everything. And and I, I think you know, we, what you're saying is you don't have trust in our current day institutions. 
you're, you're trying to propose better ones. My point is that, you know, not if quite you there have... yet. I haven't made proposals. Okay. It still have not okay, made okay. proposals. But, but let's talk about institutions in general. Sure. Like, yes, I do think that uh, if there is no uh, um, uh, sort of evolutionary pressure on institutions, they tend to decay in fitness, right? Like yep. if, 100%. like if there's no competition, and and you know, government right is like an ultimate form of monopoly, and and our form of sort of uh, uh, competition between different administrations is is de democracy, but now we've kind of democracy wasn't invented in the age of algorithmic information propagation, and we feel like something is is breaking currently, and mm -hmm. so you know I guess my point is I, I I guess the EAC point is well I think centralized institutions can't be trusted with this sort of power, and so we shouldn't trust. Uh, that anyone has the monopoly on this power, but we don't think that we can put this sort of power uh, back in the bottle or like the, the the upside is too high that every agent is gonna want access to it. And so if we if we accept that advanced intelligence uh, will exist, which I guess we disagree on whether we can control that or not, uh, like, if, you know, advanced intelligence will exist. It should be in the hands of many, not concentrated in the hands of a few that can use it to oppress others, right? And so mm -hmm. I think we agree on that. But how yeah, do I we... Yeah, a lot ahead. of these intuitions are good. I'm not disagreeing with many of your intuitions. I think I have some additional intuitions and additional models that met to other outcomes. So, yeah, what we definitely agree on is that, like, your current institutions are just, like, not up to the task. Like if we just like continue our current institutions, we don't change anything, we keep going, we run into a wall. Like I think we agree on that. Like this is just not sustainable. And in a sense, I feel like, at least in my perception, a lot of like San Francisco type, uh, you know, EAC-ish, you know, techno-optimism is kind of like, feels like a trauma response to decaying institutions. Where like you've been so traumatized kind of by like, you know, bad institutions, rightfully so, by the way, that you're like, well, fuck it. I'm not going to work with institutions at all. We have to like circumvent them. Like they're like inherently not good. And I think this is a not unreasonable like position because it's the position I held for most of my life. I understand where this is coming from. And but in a sense, it's kind of like it's a utopian fantasy. It's kind of like the tech nerds kind of like fantasy that you don't have to deal with people is that you can somehow circumvent dealing with people or dealing with the messiness of institutions to make a good world and i no longer believe that's true like i just think that act so if you take one thing away from me if you take one thing believe away from all of my beliefs please take away that i think building a good world is actually hard there's yep. no simple trick there is and when i say actually hard i don't mean like well we're gonna have to you know lift a heavier weight than usual. I mean like, you know, solve an extremely complicated high dimensional puzzle that we can like barely fit into our brain if at all kind of hard. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I don't think there's a simple solution. Like, you know, a lot of people in the past believe stuff like free market, that's a solution. But what happens if you have free market? A monopolies form immediately and your free market collapses. It's not a stable, it's not a stable equilibrium. So now you need to do something that stops the monopolies from forming. But stopping monopoly from forming needs some kind of like thing that's not the market. So now you already have something which is not a free market. There's already some but other thing involved. There should be a market, uh, there should be a competition for institutions right? Like we should keep institutions in check by having alternative institutions and the ability for alternative institutions to try to outcompete current institutions to keep them in check. And that's all we're arguing for. We're not against like the existence of institutions. We're saying today's institutions but, are failing us. And yep. if, they le if, if we don't allow alternative institutions to exist and try to out outcompete them, then we're stuck with them and we're, we're in a bad spot. And so it's yep. all about encouraging variance. And you're right. It's I'm a honestly. high... Policy at all levels is a very high dimensional dynamic optimization problem. And that is what we're arguing for. Dynamism, mm -hmm. always keeping this adaptivity and, and which is not necessarily present in current day, you know, uh, institutions. Yeah. Totally understood. And like, yeah. I think this is a, this is a good description of reality. Like, I don't want to dismiss this as like, like, yeah, you are observing true facts. I don't think you're crazy. I don't think the EAC, you know, some of your, some of your followers are crazy, <laughs> um, but like, a lot of the people that you know follow the kinds of beliefs you talk about, I don't think you're crazy. 
Like, I don't think some of you are, but like, I think most of you are not crazy. You're seeing I'll things with your eyes. You're, you know, you're, you're seeing things with your eyes, which are real. You're, you're trying to solve these problems. And I respect that, right? Like, I understand. Um, I think the, the point here I'm trying to make is just like, and then you have competition is not an atomic action. This is not a dial you turn up and down. This is an extremely complicated thing you're asking for. This is what I meant by the free market analogy. It seems like, well, if you just remove all the regulation, then you would have the most competition. But in fact, that's not true. In fact, if you remove all regulation, you just get new monopolies that form new regulation. So now you need something to remove the monopolies. But that thing is in itself not free. Well, so now you have to add in some control mechanisms for that thing. We agree that if monopoly then inducing or, or achieving regulatory capture is bad. And that's also what we're fighting in the present moment we feel like is happening in that the AI safety discussion is being leveraged instrumentally for this yeah. regulatory capture. And I don't even disagree with you here, by the way. Like, yeah. I do think that many people are taking the AI safety discussion to be about regulation. Whatever. I also would like to make clear that a lot of people are not doing that. Like, they actually believe what they're saying. Please believe them when they say that. Not all of them. Some of them are very cynical. But they are instrumental at the end of the day, whether sure. they like And I think not. so yeah. are the EAC people. Obviously sure. instrumental for people who just want to take, you know, uh, to perform, you know, oligopolies and monopolies. Or for startups sector. to be able to compete. Or for startup right. or whatever. Yeah. But even then, like, you know, wanting, you know, your open source models and whatever is very convenient for companies trying to shirk liability. Like there are many things that are very, there's a reason that there's more EACs at like top tech companies than there are non-EACs. Like this is not a coincidence. Like it's like, but it's because it's somehow... a useful ideology for capitalist systems. Like, of course. The, the leaderships of the big labs somehow are more EA, AI safety -ish, which is kind of interesting. And we see how having sort of a, a system that's in control that is primarily ideolo ideological and not aligned with shareholder value can can yield some pretty bad outcomes. I mean, opening, I almost imploded, uh, right? Because there was a decapitation attack. And that's kind of what we're, that's kind of what we're saying. It's like either you have uh, you know, alignment with the growth of the organism that you're controlling, or you're going to steer it in a in a self-destructive direction. And that almost happened, right? And so... I mean, I don't... I thought you would be in favor of institutions dying. I thought, why aren't you in favor of OpenAI collapsing if it's inefficient? No, I, mean, I don't think it's inefficient, but I think that, uh, you know, it had uh, leadership that wasn't... Uh, uh, beholden to shareholders, right? Because so it's a non-profit structure. So would you think structure. it's good if it collapsed then? Because then other systems which are more aligned with your thing could take over. Isn't that the point of competition? No, I mean, I mean, OpenAI is not necessarily EA or EAC. I think like, uh, I think they're trying to strike a balance. Um, I think I'm making, that- Sorry, yeah. I'm trying to make a point. The point I'm trying to make is it's not easy. Like there's no, there, like, it's not like competition is like a simple thing. It's not an atomic thing. It's a complicated mix of things. There's a bunch of things in a bucket that we call competition, but it's actually many different things. And you can get it's more- It's a search and algorithm and maintaining the health of that search algorithm, whether through legislation and competition, like that is our goal. I think we're aligned there actually. I, I, I'm I think not sure, is, but- So the way I think about this is personally, is that it is a tool in a toolbox. I think competition is one of the tools. I think it's a great tool. I think it's a really good tool. I mm -hmm. think there should be more competition in the world, a lot more. Uh, me and my friend, um, so like you know, Scott Alexander in the past wrote a blog that a lot of EAs love called "In Favor mm -hmm. of Niceness and Civilization," and me and a friend of mine wrote a post again uh, counter to that, which is against niceness and for civilization, and which is all about how no competition is an extremely important part of what makes civilization mm -hmm. great. If we don't have, like, you don't want a lawyer, two lawyers on opposite sides being nice to each other. That would be terrible. You want them to be as adversarial as possible. Mm -hmm. You want them to use every trick. You want them to take out every shred of evidence. And when you have two companies competing for the best product, you want them to pull out all stops. You want them to make the best product. You want them to compete down to the margin. I totally agree. But, mm -hmm. and here's the but, here's the but. The but is, if you just do this naively, you don't get good outcomes. You get monopolies, shitty products, you know, environmental pollution, no externalities get priced, tragedy of the commons. 
this is what happens empirically look into the past when you didn't have these kind of regulations so right. you also need tools to address those things and the and the market and competition doesn't do that empirically let's Just look let's dig it. into that i think i think that those examples are usually from sort of uh regulatory capture and not allowing sort of incumbents to be disrupt suppressing potential disruptions to incumbents doesn't keep their power in in, in check right but how uh, do you but how do you do that like how do you stop incumbents from doing that well i mean usually right if you really hate the current monopoly people really hate it and see a financial upside to creating a better alternative that is better for consumers but consumer. it's possible to stop they pool that their happen. capital what's that but it's possible to stop that from happening. There's been many cases in history where just like a monopoly is so big that the fixed costs are so large to get in, like AT&T, for example, where the fixed yep. costs are just so large that no one can get in. Well, we have we have problems with, you know, TSMC and NVIDIA. Today. Yeah, I, I, I'm not and, saying and... these problems are solved. My point is we should solve those problems, but the way to solve them is not magically waving a wand with the word competition on it. It requires actual concrete policies which yeah, are but if, complicated. Yeah, if, but if, if the incumbents deform the legal system to deepen their moat, that's when the problems arise, and that's what we're trying to avoid. Uh, but um, my point is you don't need I, the legal system necessarily. AT&T. Like AT&T didn't, like they also did regulatory capture, sure. But like they also just had all the telephone lines. Yeah, but now we have more than more than one provider. Because right? the government intervened and broke them up. Yeah, I mean, I, for the record, in some cases, I'm, I'm for, you know, anti-monopoly uh, legislation. Uh, but okay. I, I do, I like, I, I like, I, I do think like I, EAC is about doing whatever is optimal for kind of uh, th this growth and, and make, like accelerating that velocity of growth. And if you have an incumbent that is abusing the market power and is doing something that's suboptimal, like, yeah, I, I would be okay. in favor of breaking them up so that there's a more efficient ecosystem. In the case of mm -hmm. OpenAI, I think right now was a bad time. I think 90% of the ecosystem was depending on them. But I think that that little fluctuation was a good wake-up call for mm -hmm. people to really price in the platform risk of putting all their eggs in one basket, right? And that maintains the health of the ecosystem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So this is interesting to me. So does this mean that if um, a government was pa was to pass laws which improve market mobility and you know mm -hmm. competition, whatever, this is like compatible with EAC? Like this kind of regulation yep. would be good. So if so, you would say like someone going into government to create institutions and do regulation in order to make a more stable or a more dynamic market would be compatible with the EAC ideology. Is this correct? Yeah, we we just think that currently the current discussion with AI regulation is led by the current day oligopoly, sure. and they're the ones sure. writing the laws, and so we're deeply skeptical. Oh of everything totally being written right now. But we're not, in principle, against regulations if okay. they help acceleration, right? OK, so. I mean, so this is interesting to me. So this is interesting to me because, from my perspective, I, I think a regulation is morally neutral by default. It's neither good mm -hmm. nor bad. It just depends on what the outcomes are. Like, what does it do? So this is a lot of how I think about it as well. I don't like government regulation or top-down violence or whatever because it's cool. I like it when it works, and I dislike it when it doesn't work. So this is very similar to how I, th how I think about these things. So from my perspective, like I like anti-monopoly laws, not for some ideological reason or because of some religion, but because it results in better things that I like. It results in better products. It results yeah. in better life. So it's interesting to me because it seems you come to a, you know, not identical, but like similar ballpark of conclusions, but kind of from a different, slightly different pr perspective. I justify it by the product. Like I like efficient markets because they make yep. people happier. I don't like efficient. That? Now that is a good question. Yeah, I, 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 we could dig into that, but uh, I think please we finish should, your point. by the way. But like, um, and well, it seems, if I understand you correctly, you're saying something like you like anti monopoly laws because it makes the market more efficient. So you seem like you're one meta yeah. level up. Is this correct? Yeah, 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 like I, I do agree with you that it yields better products because if you don't have the market selective pressures mm -hmm. applied at a more granular mm -hmm. level within your organization, you're kind of sheltering. Mm -hmm. You don't have that market signal that helps you optimize your product and, and yeah. have a more efficient mm -hmm. search over the space of technologies Make and converge on. So we're yeah. on the same page.
So, okay, cool. Yeah. So uh, again, I'm just probing and trying yeah, yeah, yeah. to understand and so on. Um, sure, sure. Um, um, so if there was legislation that makes the market less competitive, but results mm. in a better products, is this good or bad? I'm very skeptical of, of that being possible because again, you know, this is what you learn doing a startup. You have to make contact with the market. And, and again, I'm not making an instrumental claim. I'm not saying this is true or false. I'm saying like, if you had some data, which is like really convincing on this, is there a moral aspect to it or would you follow the data? Um, yeah, I mean, we should do what's optimal for, for, for growth. Yeah, but so let's say it's not that growth. could include it's legislation. Growth. But I'm very skeptical that a global, fixed, very slow clock rate hyperparameter setting could outcompete of a, a, a bottom up like contact with the market very fast sure. iteration cycle. I, I mean, right? Like there are examples. My precedent, such as leaded gasoline. Leaded gasoline would be an example. Sure. Yeah, so, but but that we we got enough data and we we enacted. But like to be clear, it. like it was known that leaded gasoline was dangerous before it was released. Like the company, the scientists did know that it was poisonous. This was a piece of information that did exist. Same thing that like tobacco companies knew that tobacco caused cancer decades before they publicly admitted. Like, the data did exist. It's just it was hidden. It was and it was there was a propaganda campaign and there was an attempt to stop regulation because it would make the market less efficient. I I I think like we this is why maintaining freedom of access to information, freedom of AI and compute, because I think that the future of mimetic warfare, you need to have your own AI augmentation to help filter through data and, and not be uh, cognitively hacked. Uh, like that's why we we think that's important. Like free access to information so that consumers at the end of the day, there's like a micro democracy with it. each company. Consumers have, to have enough information they can boycott uh, or can they can demand legislation, right? And so that's why like freedom of access to information, freedom of access to AI is super important. If only a few players have access to AI and they can they can bias the information they give you and then and then they can steer you by proxy and we think i i think that that would be very dangerous right so um, so am i correct in saying you think information asymmetries cars are market failures or cause market failures yeah okay yeah and this is a very reasonable position to hold yeah. this is i i agree basically i'm just interested in this so yeah, yeah. like would you describe leaded gasoline as a market failure i think um deforming like having an unhealthy landscape and a biased landscape of information propagation uh, induces, yeah, market failures, right? And and here we see that if people weren't like if you presented the information to people, like real, you know, information, not like you know extrapolations mm -hmm. that are, yeah, like if you present real information, people can make their own minds and decide like, hey, I don't, I don't want to support this, and then they don't buy the product, right? And okay. and, and this happens all the time, yeah. Okay, so then I have a question. How the hell do we do that? <laughs> that seems really hard. How you you want to like legislate that everyone has to say the truth all the time? Like <laughs> um yeah, well, I I'm trying to avoid uh weird attractors where you have this sort of top-down control of of these information propagation uh, uh mechanisms, right? Like if the government was in charge of social media and biasing the algorithms, that'd be bad. We almost went there, right? That almost happened. I mean, don't then, worry. The corporations are doing a bad enough job on their own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, you know, if it was all centralized, one party that's self... The, the thing you got to remember is like every system and subsystem is self-interested, including the control systems, right? In, including the people we put in, 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 in power. And we got to uh, uh, keep that in mind. But uh, I, I just see a way forward where potentially you have a sort of centralization of AI and then they use it to control information propagation and they use it to uh, adversarially, you know, memetically engineer, uh, prompt engineer people and then steer them in whatever direction so they want. Th this is what I don't yeah. understand. Why wouldn't corporations in the free market do this too? Uh, like in your would... EAC utopia, mm -hmm. why why don't I mean we do that we do. we do human prompt engineering it's called advertising it everybody's trying to subvert yes, everyone and else and why right? does this not lead to the same failure modes same failure modes what do you mean like I mean people are just trying to sell their products every agent is interested in its own growth and it's going to try yes. to subvert no, other agents but like to... you're saying there's this problem where like there'll be a dis you know the the information landscape will be distorted and there'll be market failures mm. etc why doesn't this happen here too but I, I I think like if if people 
can have, uh, let, let's say there's a power asymmetry because corporations and government have AIs that are very good at, at prompt engineering humans. We don't even need, don't have, they just have more money, right? Like it doesn't even have to be AI. Yeah, but, but money, if, if you have, let's say, open source and you have your own compute and you didn't legislate that ability away, people can have sort of filtering, like just like a spam filter is an augmentation of your ability to filter through your inbox using AI. Right? And yeah, that's but the they all have better happening. AI than you. So who cares? Doesn't matter. There's like, the always going to be a power asymmetry that. that maintains the hierarchical order of power, right? And that's so why. Do you think I, the current order of power is okay? Um, I think we should um, search over hierarchical power structures of cybernetic control that uh, that yield better growth for the whole organism. But I don't think there's going to be a fully decentralized uh, system. Like we are fighting, we're pushing the discussion towards that direction. Right, but the the reality is that the Optimum is a hierarchical cybernetic control system, right? Like, mm -hmm. and but but then we can test like how much power we give any level of the, the the hierarchy, and we should like dynamically test that, and not just like immediately give all the power to the top node because we're scared of sure. Uh, but so what can happen in the near future? Yeah. So what you're saying is decentralization will not work, is not the correct solution. It will have to be some form of hierarchy. Not just, I'm not saying you know one node at the top by any means, but it will be some form of hierarchy. Well, it's like Maybe layered decentralization is a hierarchy, right? If you have layers, right? And people yeah, roll is, ups anyways for more efficiency. Whatever, right? right? Yeah. But like, so you do think that like every man is his own island wouldn't work? Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't think like that, that would be like, um, you know, maximally disordered system with very low correlations right. to make an analogy. Like that's a high temperature phase. That's all entropic. There's no order. Again, free energy is a balance between order and, and entropy, right? Again, okay. don't want to maximize entropy. That would be bad. <laughs> free energy. Free energy. That's what yeah, yeah, I know. Free, free energy, energy, sure. Happy to talk about that. But entropy is bad. OK, so interesting. Um, And I basically agree with most of what you say. Like, this is how I think about these things as well. I don't think we have found the best way of architecting our like co coordination and in information exchange mechanisms on a civilizational level by all. Yeah. My fundamental belief, so you know, this all started by you asking me, what are my proposals? Mm -hmm. My proposals is we can do better than this and we should really, really fucking try. Like we should really, really fucking try. But and how do we, we find we, how to do that, right? Yep, and so one of my claims is, is that like, we don't need to do a blind optimization process. We don't need to do blind e evolution. We're not that stupid. We've learned a lot. When the Enlightenment happened, you know, when French intellectuals came up with like democracy and science and whatever, they didn't have game theory. They didn't have mechanism design. They didn't have you know anything about rationality or psychology. Like obviously, we can design better systems than this. Obviously. Like obviously, we we have learned many things about how to design better corporations, about how to design better voting mechanisms, about how to do better, you know, you know, quadratic voting. Like obviously, we can design better systems than what we have right now. This is my claim. I so you know I th I think like this is the eternal, uh, you know, debate. Let's say even even in startups designing products, it's like do I have like my own prior from 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 either data history or my tastes, and then I I have a I use my model of the world to, to guide policy, or do I assume I have an uninformative prior and I just take in the data and adapt in an online Bayesian fashion? Like your point is that we should look at history and and have a model of how the world will evolve rather than having sort of uninformative prior and just letting the market-based optimization rip and, and converge on the I, I'm right? saying we can and we would be stupid not to like we have learned things and like the whole like uninformative prior is obviously not true there is literally no one who can has the literally uninformed prior like this is not there's no company that you know takes random atoms and smashes them together to generate new products there is no such thing <laughs> like there is no such thing obviously everything is based on priors and models that we have about what the world is no one just randomly generates products that's yep. not how the world works and i'm and i'm claiming that like we i'm not i'm not saying okay and i figured it out here it is because that would be insane if i said mm. i have the perfect utopian system that doesn't need to be tested trust me bro obviously that would be crazy what i'm okay. instead saying is we can do better than random and then we have to gather data then we have to try, then we have to test with reality, we have to have debates with people like you, we have to test these ideas, and you know, maybe we find things we didn't think about. But we can do a hell of a lot better than random. I don't, I don't know, I don't know, right? Like, uh, it's like saying, like, 
can you predict the stock market better, much better than random? Or oh, much I think than... actually this is a very different thing. I think the stock market is a very different type of similar thing. complex system, right? No, I disagree. I very strongly disagree with this. It is also a complex system, but it's a different type of complex system. There are many types of complex systems. You know, for example, a gas, an ideal gas in a, in a container, from the molecular perspective, is a very complex object. I'm sure you would agree. But Yeah, but you could reduce, you have like some, yes. some parameters that you can predict yes. mean field. But then and you're arguing for like top-down economic control from like, you know, statistics. I'm, which... I'm arguing that there are symmetries, that there are things which are not random. I'm claiming that like reality and culture is not encrypted. It's not homomorphically encrypted. It's not maximally adversarial. It could get to that point if we get AGIs designing like maximally confusing, you know, you know, adversarial memetics or whatever. It could get to that point. But currently it is definitely not that. I'm claiming that the market on civilization design is extremely not efficient. This is not the case, for example, with you know, short-term S&P 500 stock prices. Those are quite efficient, actually. Mm. Uh, but I'm claiming that the number of people who actually try and actually put in the effort, at, like you know, you or my levels of education and IQ, mm -hmm. actually try to build new and better institutions and gather the data, adapt to what they learn, learn new skills, you know, take in what we've learned in the 20th and 21st century about behavioral economics and science and all these other things and actually use the scientific method and turn it from the physical sciences and onto the problem of institution design, I claim that, yeah, we have not nearly taken all the alpha that is there. So, so I, I think your, your thesis is that your model has uh, fairly good mutual information with the actual future and then that you know, if you have a certain number of bits of ability to predict, I don't know, like you're, you have good KL divergence, let's say, um, then then we should enact policies that leverage that information we have for the future to, to do optimal control. My point is that I think that we may be overestimating uh, how well we can predict the future. And so so maybe not, like if, if we don't have good information about the, how the future will go, maybe we should have a, a lighter touch uh, control, right? Because if, if if you have uncertainty, yeah. uh, if, if there's a large divergence between your model and reality, th most things that you're going to do are going to be negative, ne negative, yes. right? Impact, right? And so, but like quantifying the bits of certainty we have about the future, and and now we're discussing models of how the the future and the economy will go. That that we can discuss all day, and then and then I think we should we should tune how. Uh, uh, strongly, we enforce top-down control according to our certainty about the future, right? Sure, and, sure. Yeah. But your, your argument proves too much. Your argument proves way too much. Your argument, if you took it as, you know, what it implies, it should imply that engineering is impossible. There's so many atoms. You know, how could we know that what happens if we move these atoms in these directions? How could we know? The uncertainties too, our mutual information bits about reality are too, I'm like, Bro, it depends like, on the down. complexity of a system. No, no, no. But it, there, there's a notion of like how how difficult uh, a certain complex system is to to predict. There are yes. systems. Yes, and I'm claiming, I'm making a strong claim that the amount of optimization pressure that has felt fl gone from like people like you and me, you know, smart, educated, young, energetic, you know, tech guys into trying to design institutions is a fucking pittance compared to what has gone into Facebook's ad algorithm. Sure. No, I, so we I don't do even agree that we, if it's hard. We haven't tried. Oh, well, we, we need to create better institutions, but so we should I think, try. But I, I'm just very skeptical of trying to give the keys to the future to current day institutions. Yes, me too. That's why I'm trying to create new institutions. Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know exactly. This is why I need to know more about like your platform, what you're proposing so, to me. You know, you've been I talking to yes. existing institutions and, and I, I yes. don't know what's going on there, right? So Yes, and so you can disagree with my proposal. You can think they're wrong or they're bad or I'm making a mistake. I think this is a very reasonable thing to believe. I'm sure I'm making mistakes with my current policy because the world is complicated and hard. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure some of the things I'm currently proposing are net negative. I'm sure of this, and I'm sure some of the things you will believe that some of the things you're proposing are net negative. I'm sure you mm -hmm. have that much humbleness inside of you, at least yep. I hope. Um, and so that's all fine. I'm making 
kind of more the meta point of like, what is my intention? How do I think about the process of doing good things? The process I'm trying to argue when I talk about policy and I talk about coordination, this is what I'm talking about. I'm saying, why should you believe that something in this area is possible? And my argument is because no one has tried. You haven't tried. Have you tried to engage with the institutions or build new ones? Have you I've tried. tried? I mean, okay, honestly. I went to big tech, right? I, 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 before doing a startup, I was like, I'm gonna try to go to big tech and, and, and see if I could change these institutions from the inside. And, and what I saw was that culture steers the institutions. And yes. then I was like, it's upstream. Good institutions are downstream from good culture. And that's where mm -hmm. I started culturally engineering the world <laughs> with EAC to some extent. Fantastic. So like, there you so. go, respect, man. Like respect, I mean, you're wrong and you're gonna make everything worse, but respect, <laughs> you tried. <laughs> Fair <laughs> like, enough. <laughs> like, you know, you will say the same thing about me, obviously. And like, I, you know, but like, okay, respect. Like, fine, you tried and you found some alpha. Wow, what a surprise. It's almost like just like some dude from Quebec shit posting some shit on Twitter can actually find a massive amount of alpha because literally no one is trying and the market is inefficient. Mm -hmm. this is, is it not weird to you that just some guy from Quebec, you know, I'm sure you're charming and smart and handsome and everything, but like, you know, created a, a alt and created like this, you know, at least you said in the thing another podcast initially yeah. started kind of as a joke or like not too yeah. serious and became more serious over time and despite this you got all this energy all this free alpha all this political power started flowing is this not suspicious to you is it not weird how easy it was to get to this point is it not mm -hmm. weird that there is like the, why did no one else do it why was it you why aren't there 10 EACs out there? Why is it, why, why did yours I think work? there's been movements that have high inner product o o o over time, but I, I think by construction, EAC is aligned with the natural tendencies of the techno capital machine. And so, or, or we're trying to be like, literally the goal is to be aligned to the, the natural tendencies towards growth. Yes. And so naturally it's, it's gonna confer uh, to Darren's like a uh, higher alpha for, for growth and, and, and on average, that means the subculture will grow. So it's been engineered to be this way from first principles and that's why it's successful, maybe. I don't, don't know. That... Don't let this go to your head, but you're severely underselling yourself. <laughs> like, I think you don't understand how much of this is because you were charming and you tried really hard. I think you were, like my model of this is really that you were underselling how much this would have not happened if not it happened to be you and you happened to try. Like my model of the world is that there was a lot of, there's a huge agency gap. Like yeah. a lot of the well, reason EAC exists as a movement, you know, people like fucking Gary Tan put the stupid shit in their, in their bio is because you were charming, you spent a lot of time and you tried. I think we both agree though, that we want people to have more agency and step up. Like there are no adults in the room yes. coming to save us, right? I, exactly. I think for me, that realization in my mid twenties was when I was the adult in the room, in, yes. a, in a, an important room. And my advice was was used to enact things that yep. were high impact. That's when yep. you realize, oh man, like it's just up to us to step up. But I, yep. I think like I think our generation feels sort of like they don't they can't necessarily penetrate an existing institution. Yep. There's all sorts of immune systems to sort of suppress yep. new entrants, and so we should create new ones. And I think yep. that's what we're arguing for. Um, but it's not. You're saying it's just submit to the market, bro. No, no, we want a market of institutions, right? That's, I, I don't know. I, I think, yes, I think I, you're- I get, So, okay, let me combine this to the points I made previously. You want a market of institutions based. <laughs> like, first of all, based. Cool, awesome, love it. But now I'm also making the point, that's hard. You need to do policy, you need regulation, you need to work with current institutions, you like you need yeah. to prevent all the f market failure modes. How do you legislate, you know, around like information? But we need to hype test our hypotheses of what works. And so we need A B sure. testing. We can't have one global policy because then it's really hard to A B test if you have like one central sure. node prescribing sure. things for the entire all planet, this right? Is fine. And I think this is based and you should go work for the Charter Cities Institute or whatever, right? <laughs> like this is based. Great. I'm not denying any of this. Sure. I'm not, I, if we could have, I would think it was great if we just had like some countries where just like fucking everything is legal and like, and they just try and like all medicines are legal there and lol, we'll see what happens based, right? You know, maybe not all of them, but like, you know what I mean? Yep. And I think stuff like this is probably not good. Cool. 
all right, we've established this. Like we, we institutions are, are, are dysfunctional, super agree. If we give more power to dysfunctional institutions, that doesn't make things better, why would it? If we could improve institutions, I think we agree this would be base, this would be great. Yep. And you propose the best way to improve institutions is just through, let's basically through market-based evolution. Disruption. Dis disruption, market-based evolution, et cetera. Yep. Fair enough. I think this is a reasonable position to hold. I'm not saying you're wrong. Um, mm -hmm. I'm making a, a stronger case than it for agency, I think, than you are. Or I'm thinking, I think the market is so absurdly inefficient that you can just do better by just literally thinking about it um, and just trying. But I don't have to defend this point if you strongly. Well, well samples are costly, right? To test your hypotheses of what a yes. what a certain uh, policy, what its impact will be in this complex system, doing a rollout in the real world is extremely costly, and so you should yes. be Bayesian and and have as rich of a prior as you can to be more sample efficient, right? I, I totally get that, right? Yeah, um, it's yes, but exactly. I all all we're pushing for is a bit of humility that our models might like not have ha as high accuracy as we estimate them to have, right? And, and, uh, and I then, mean, of course, this is a fully general piece of advice. At some point, you should stop updating. Like, at some point, you should not get even more uncertain. You should, most people are overconfident. I think this is a very fair thing to say. But at some point, you have to stop updating so, downwards. So, so, so my, at least uh, going back to our hierarchical control structure, as you go up in the hierarchy, there's less and less sort of like bits of information you have about the future at larger and larger scales, it's very hard to predict the, the whole macro system. If you're talking about the whole macro system, there's maybe a few statistics that you could predict, right? And that's just a, a few bits. And so you should be lighter and lighter touch in your uh, ability to control, like your, your top-down feedback, that in a way that's kind of proportional to how many bits you have about the future, right? And so that naturally yields this sort of hierarchical control system, right? But like banning, having very precise description uh, prescriptions that are that are that are legislated, you know, at like a national level or international level. Like I'm just saying, we should really have very high certainty that this is the right move uh, before we we do something like that. And I think right now there's too high uncertainty, uh, uh, and we should we should be cautious about making a move we regret, especially because given that legislations are so hard to walk back. Um, yeah, right. Um, but I'm the one living in fear. Lol. Um, joking. But um, it's all risk my, reward. I don't know. That, that I mean, to, to, yes, but like it seems like you're just extremely terrified in a sense around like doing something wrong in this direction to a degree which seems kind of unreasonable to me. Like I. Agree. I mean, we have a strong prior of how like giving too much power. To, to governments and very few individuals, how that can really backfire. And I think there's a there's a weird um, there's a there's a gap right now of mass uncertainty where people are scared and they're they're afraid yeah, yes. and they're high uncertainty about the future. And that's instrumental for some okay. people to okay. to to con consolidate power, crystallize it, and then it's very hard to disrupt that. And okay. I we want to make sure that that does not happen. And that's why we're fighting tooth and nail to be the counterforce to that uh, happening right, right now. Right. So you want to fight tooth and nail from someone actually trying to create policy because it is high uncertainty. I, I think uh, strong armed uh, policy or, or policy that's too heavy handed uh, would be But like, what does too really heavy bad. handed mean? Like, I like, it's well, like, it's, this is obviously up to interpretation. It's obviously just totally. based on like the whatever. And totally. so, okay, but like, great. Like, okay, like, okay, I'll come to the punchline, sorry. Like, I've been, okay. I've been delaying the punchline the whole time. Okay, let me get to the actual punchline. If you follow the policy you do, you don't do anything that improves institutions, and then predictably, some point, you die. You are completely correct about what you're saying about the high levels of hierarchy. There becomes less and less things you can say with great certainty over the long future. This is actually not exactly true. It actually kind of also goes the other way around. For example, it is very easy to predict the energy of a given system arbitrarily far in the future. It will be the same if nothing comes. That's one statistic, one quantity. Yes, one yes quantity. it's one quantity. Not that many bits. I know, right. I know. Yeah. I know. I think this is a good analogy. I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I think this is a nice analogy. Cool. So I'm not claiming 
I know on this date with this thing, this will go wrong in this way using this technology, which will lead to an unrecoverable state. I'm saying if you keep just randomly rolling the dice over and over again with no plan to ever stop rolling or removing the bad faces of the die somehow, then eventually you roll death. Eventually you roll the X risk. This is, I can say, with, high con with extremely high confidence. I think the, the dice is not uh, identically distributed through time, right? Like our, like but it will be if you don't do We take calculated risks. Something. Like if you, don't, if you don't do policy, if you don't improve institutions, if you don't make better ways of wielding No, we, we, sh we should do all that. We ju I just think like right now it's far too early and it's far too instrumental to a select few to over legislate okay. while well, then we're when in is the right time? When is the right time? When we have a better prior on how and the when market is that? When and do the we world... know? When do we know? Like when do I wake up and say, all right, now's now's go time? When? Well, I mean, right now, I I don't I don't think it's right now because there's just too much things are moving dynamically. Like if you're okay. gonna But things will only get more dynamic in the future. When does it stop? When does the buck stop? When do you act? Well, I mean, it's not going wrong. I mean, GPT-4, people thought, would melt the world or something. Again, Everything's... when do you act? When? What is the sign that when you see on the sky... It's a continuum. The... There's no discrete point. It's so like, you okay, don't you have can... a plan. So you don't have a plan. What you're saying is you have no plan. You have no threshold to no, action. No, we, you we don't should know what to do. So you say we should just fashion. wait and see what happens, bro. Well, no, we, we, we should play by ear is what I'm, is what yeah, I'm saying. So you we don't have, have a plan. Online That's adaptive. a different way of saying you don't have a plan. Well, plan is you have like you're trying to do model-based control. You're trying to have a long time rollout and then you're, you're, you're trying to do planning and optimally control things. But then if your model has a large divergence with the future, then your, your optimal control is actually highly suboptimal, right? And I'm saying we should, because we're in a time of high uncertainty, we should do things that are on shorter time scales, uh, O only enact, uh, install policies that change things for short time scales because the situation is so dynamic. But my and point is, it will only get more dynamic. There will never be yeah. like God comes from the heavens and all right, guys, now's well, the time. You well, that's that's, that's why capitalism is is awesome. You, you have corporate policies adapting on different uh, uh, time scales, right? Yet, like you have corporate hierarchies and you make decisions of cybernetic control on different time scales. Um, and, and you can change the, the sort of sampling rate of uh, which you adapt, and, th and that's yeah, why- Yeah, why isn't that time now? Why isn't now the time? Why not? You don't have a plan. You don't have a model. Maybe I mean, right. I think you every corporation is adapting in an online fashion to the landscape. Sure, but right? if I say now is go time, now is the time for big regulation, now the time is for, for, you know, that's a different question. You don't even have a way to evaluate it. You don't even have a function to evaluate. You just said play it by ear. You don't even have no, a way to evaluate I, I, it. I do think that- my point is like current institutions have such a slow clock rate uh, that yes, basically, but if I claim now even if you have a good hard. thesis, a good tangent right now, a, a model, a first order model of how the future will go from like the local temporal tangent, like that first order model is going to be super inaccurate in the future. And if you have a very low clock rate of adaptivity, hyperparameter setting that you impose now and, you, and it's like crystallized forever, that's going to be highly sub suboptimal, right? Like it's just, it's going to be net yes. negative, right? But then at some point you have to act. Like you're just making excuses. This is just cope. This is just cope for not no. acting now. But I mean, every every company is acting and, and, and adapting to the situation and, and incorporating and AI. Yes, in but ways, at some right? but if they're making a mistake, if everyone is making a mistake and AGI is around the corner and it will kill everybody, if this is true. Uh, no, I, well, we disagree on that. But anyway. Yeah, so, yeah, sure, fine. But you don't have a plan, so I don't care. Like you don't have a plan. You said you don't have a plan. You don't. I, have I'm a literally evaluation. saying why long-term planning is not optimal. Yes, at this and this stage. is my point. You don't have a plan for long-term or short-term planning. You don't have a plan. There is no plan. The only thing you're talking about no, is I, I, oh, I think, we should play it by ear. This is no, not. No, I, I, I think that the system adapts, right? Like uh, there's there's planning happening. Yes, at you think a, God will say lower it? levels. The lower levels of the hierarchical cybernetic control tree adapt on a faster time scale and are adaptive to the changing landscape of technology today. I think that once 
you know, we distill certain bits of information that are less dynamic. We can crystallize policies at the mother node once that becomes apparent. But right now, there's nothing. And again, when does it become apparent? When when there's stability in a certain trend, right? Like when 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 we see, okay, this t this keeps happening. This is bad. Oh, like an exponential increase in AI capabilities every year, stuff like that. That's gonna happen. That's just technological progress. But I oh, mean, so that know, doesn't count. That doesn't count. But like you know, like that's not you know, bad. I mean, that's gonna happen. I mean, I'm working on it, right? Like I'm working on right, the and that's not a sign that maybe there should be adaption or something. That's not a sign. Well, no, but there's huge upside to it, right? Like, I mean, we can we can solve Bro. a lot of pro problems in our world. No, but that's why, like, but then we would shut down all the upside that we're leaving behind, saving lives, solving Bro, no global one warming, says, engineering no materials. One, no one says. But we're literally proposing we compute caps. So, like. Yes, until we know how to deal with it. Like, look, if we knew how to, if you had a plan, if you were like, all right, Connor, I'm glad you asked. Here's how we ensure that like all the things you're worried about don't happen. They're not perfect. I might be wrong about some of them. Where do you think we could improve? If you had said this, I would have been like, I mean, first of all, well, I'm in a simulation. But assuming this had happened, then I would have been like, all right, I, fair enough. But you but don't I, have a plan. No but one I explained has a plan. that I think at this moment, I don't think there's it's time for a, a global but you don't have a plan for policy. when the moment comes. So you, it's worthless. Your word is the worthless. The moment because, comes? Yeah, the, yeah, There's exactly, no moment. You, it's just like constantly improving technology throughout of, throughout society. And I think like if, if we make sure that there's power equilibration, right? Everybody have, have access to, to AI power proportional, let's say to their access to capital. And we don't create sort of these weird uh, dynamics where you, you achieve regulatory capture, or you subvert uh, the low, lower levels of the hierarchy. As long as we maintain sort of a uh, uh, not too high of a power gradient at any point in society, I think the system will adiabatically adapt to constant rollouts of new technologies. That's opening eyes thesis, right? That constant rollout of cutting edge capabilities and them being incorporated is the most ethical uh, way forward, right? And yeah, so, and they're they're wrong, and they're going to okay, kill us. Okay, that's interesting. Wow. Like, it's not that hard. Like, it's not like, I don't, like, there's two, there's there's a meta point and there's the concrete point. The concrete point is this like, lol la mao, obviously this is bullshit. The meta point is just like, why do I care what you have to say? You've literally admitted that you don't have a plan and you don't know when you will have a plan. Why, or if why you do ever we need, need a plan? plan? I think that's because just, if you, if you have an adaptive, it's like, it's like saying I'm, I'm launching a rocket I'm not going to chart out all the values of the optimal controls at this stage. I'm going to adapt it according to sensors. Yes, but you have a flight path. You have a rough idea. You have an extremely precise idea when you shoot a rocket into space where it's going to go. Have you seen those flight paths and how? No, precise but there, there's there's like fine tuning. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. You know, Look, if you and me were disagreeing about the fine tuning, it's like should the compute cap be at ten to the twenty-five or ten to twenty-four? No, I, Great. But, then we could talk. But we're not talking again, about again. There, there really you have dictated. a very sharp prior from the laws of Newtonian mechanics of like where the trajectory will go, and I, I think we disagree on whether we can. Uh, predict uh, sufficient parameters yes. and of if the we can't technical predict, capital machine to optimally yes. control it. Sure. And if down. we can't predict an extremely high energetic, extremely dangerous, weird system, you shouldn't predict things are good unless you have a very sharp prior for why things are good. This is possible, but by default, I, you don't get nice things. Most, li most of the universe is cold and dead and lifeless. There is an... Ex D observing life is extremely weird. This is an extremely well, well, so, so, anomalous situation. So, so yeah, well, but that's the thing. EAC is based on the physics that underlies life. And the point is that we think that the, the thing we can predict is that the system is going to adapt to whatever. But life can growth. also just die. Like life can just end. Like mm -hmm. but life isn't fair. A meteorite can just hit the planet that's big enough. And then that's just it. Mm. I mean, it did, and then we bounced back better if than ever. If it was big enough to just liquefy the planet, it would just be over, and then that's yeah. Just but it. I, I just don't think that 
uh, a constant rollout of intelligence being progressively incorporated in our techno capital machine is going to be that discrete event that causes mass disruption. I don't and care if the it's system discrete or not. This is irrelevant. My no, I, I think it's very relevant because a complex system failure is when the system is maladapted to a sudden change in, in, in the environment. And, and the point is, if you keep things malleable and, and constant, changing on a fast enough clock rate, as you, you adiabatically slowly change uh, uh, the effective landscape, so constant rollout of new capabilities, then the system can 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 morph to 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 incorporate it and 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 incorporate this new reality and not fail, right? And I think like that is literally like what we're arguing for that like crystallizing anything at the global level right now will cause later failure because we're going to be maladapted to reality that we failed to predict accurately. Do you think these words would have been much, you know, uh, comfort to Neanderthals? Um, so, you, well, you could talk about evolution. I mean, we're already getting steered evolutionarily by the techno capital machine as is. So, like, where do you draw the line? Like, okay, should we go back to, you know, back to the cave and, uh, you know, give up I'm the I'm asking the modern you a world? question. Do you think these words would have been not good words to say to Homo Neanderthalus? Do you think you would have been happy with that? Well, I mean, you know, part of their genes live in us today. They've had some fractional you think that they're happy about success that? in the you future. Think they care. Their their selfish genes are. Uh, yeah, but do they care? They were people. Um, do they care? But I mean, the pe even the the Homo sapiens of that time, they're not alive. They don't, you know. Yeah, they and don't you care. Think like all that's been passed on is, is genes, right? So sure, but like, so what? Okay, you pass your gene, and then I everybody, kill you. everything, okay everyone, and every one dies. Every institution dies. Every empire sure, dies. but I still care about people. I don't care about genes. So like, if I, you know, if you go pregnant a bunch of women and I shoot you in the head, are you happy? Um, I I think every again, everyone dies, and all you leave behind is your legacy. But you have are you information happy? With a, I think you're pretty happy if you have high mutual information with the future and it's secured. Uh, I, I think that's the basis for happiness, but that's just my theory. You, like if you, you have a lot of children, then you're maybe not scared as death. If, if you have a large legacy and it's secured, maybe you're at peace with it. I'm, I'm not afraid of death, like in general. I just think like I'm going to do everything I can to impact the world in the direction I think is good. Uh, while I have, while I am alive, but I am not trying to be immortal. I don't know, but but that's and that's actually you know point of fracture with an EX and people are, uh, tr you know, against death. But I I think death just You're like sunsetting death. clauses. <laughs> I think death is an important part of this cyclical adaptation, j just like dissipation is in a thermodynamic system. Um, and so I think injection of constant novelty and fading out. Of the old is 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 important to maintain adaptability, which helps us converge onto bigger, grander, more beautiful things. Well, I hope you're right. Um, sure, sure feels like you're just letting, uh, you know, taking letting Jesus take the wheel here. And I think my whole claim, again, if you take anything from this, I think we can do better than that. I think you, literally you and me, not, this is not a metaphor, like literally <laughs> you and literally. We should, we should chat. We should keep chatting. This was really productive. Honestly, I, I feel like I understand your position better. You're starting to understand us uh, better. Um, I think this I understand you lot. better. I don't think your followers believe what you think they believe. Well, I mean, it's hard to tell, you know, off of uh, Twitter memes and so on, but you know, I, I am me. Uh, you know, I may yep. have written the manifesto and so on. And, you know, I'm just saying my opinions and my model of the world here in this conversation. Uh, yep. But again, EAC is not a single uh, point of opinions. It's kind of a cloud that makes it sort of <laughs> in alignment with our thesis about uh, variance and all hyperparameters. But um, yeah, I mean, um, I think this was a lot of fun. I think we're nearing uh, three hours at this point. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe we split split it yeah. up into more podcasts in, in the future. But, uh, you know, well, really appreciate yeah. you uh, taking yeah. the time. Um, yeah. No, thank you as well. I, I, I want to say this again. I said at the beginning, I'll say it again. I really appreciate and respect that you take the time to actually talk about your opinions, you know. Likewise. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't an easy debate to have and so on. And I grilled you pretty hard a few times, you know. N nothing personal, like truly nothing personal. Sure, you know, sure. Like, no, you know, I mean, competition I, I, is I good, welcome. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. mimetic competition is good. You know, you should roast my ideas, and I should roast yours, and I think this is good, and we can still respect each other people. So I never really fully revealed the punchline, I'm sorry, about like the thing I was trying to talk about. Yeah, there's a long build said, up. <laughs> there, I never yeah. released, what do I think we should do? And like the thing is that like I think this is what 
I think we disagree, but like this might be mm -hmm. after have have another podcast, is that like I think competition is good, but we need is that what you should do is there needs to be some things that are off limits, some things that have massive externalities, that blow up everything, that destroy competition, whatever. And within that, fucking go for it. Like optimize as hard as possible. All niceness out of the window. But if you if you expand this to encompass literally everything, you predictably end in disaster. This is what I call civilization. Civilization is not about being nice. It is about we have some rules, you know, no killing the other guy, you know, no poisoning. Do we respect those rules? How are they enforced? They need to be enforced by violence. Yeah, That's but then who in, who keeps those people in check, right? It's always this is a good guy. question. You know, this but this is a this is a design question, and I'm not saying oh, this yeah. is easy, but we've done hell of a lot better than random. Our current civilization, living in the United States or over here in London, is a hell of a lot better than living in Somalia or whatever. You know, there is plenty of more restrictions that we have here. There's plenty of things that are more restrictive here, and I'm happy to take the hit. So for me personally, coordination is about taking a hit. It's about saying, I will willingly surrender some of the things they do, for example, I can't go over to San Francisco and murder this guy because he annoys me. Because I wouldn't, because that's bad. I, I surrender this power. Not that I would do that. You know? <laughs> please um, don't, please but, don't suggest that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, anyways, but, yeah. Don't worry. I think you're stronger than me anyway. So you could probably. <laughs> <laughs> cool. um, but I think that there, it's neither all stagnation nor all optimization. I think there is a middle way. I think what we need to do is we need to cut off the tails. And then within the things that are not the tails, we go fucking hog wild. I think we're, we've already gone for three hours. You know, if you yeah. want to respond to that or whatever, but I, I don't want to take up much more of your time. Yeah, I, I think like we agree that institutional dynamism and exploring policy is the way forward. I think we agree on that. Um, I just think that in their current form, current institutions are far too slow and um, I think anything that, anything we try to do on a short time scale before we have new institutions probably will be net negative. And so that's why we have a bias towards hands off for now. Let's see how the situation evolves. You may have more urgency to take top down control reins. I think we're still in a good region. Like I don't see things going uh, south in my model. We may have different models of the future, a whole different you know, podcast whole there. Whole different topic, whole um, different podcast. But uh, I yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy we found some some common ground here and we got to understand each other's points a bit better and hopefully it's productive for our communities to yeah. have a, a discussion. And I mean, yeah. that's, the, that's the point of these things of having sort of taking political extremes is, is to have a discussion and for people to make their own minds from, from the discussion. So thanks yeah. again for taking the time and and uh, uh, thanks for thanks to MLST uh, for hosting. Yeah, thank you yeah, so much. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure.